Chapter One of Sixteenth Century Bristol. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elaine Webb, Bristol, England. Sixteenth Century Bristol by John Latimer. Chapter One. Perhaps it may not be uninteresting to readers, with some taste for local history, to give a few facts from authentic records respecting the life and doings of Bristolians in the far-off days of Henry the Eighth. The most important of these records are the account books of the Corporation, which commence in 1531, but they can be supplemented and illustrated by various other contemporary documents and some of the contrasts that can thus be made between the social customs of the sixteenth and of the twentieth centuries may prove at least amusing if not instructive the transcendent circumstance which differentiates the bristol which saw the accession of henry from the city of today is the religious faith of the inhabitants Roman Catholicism at the former period had reached the climax of its magnificence. It was the church both of the state and of the people, and there was not a whisper of dissent, for nonconformity was punishable with a cruel death. The young king was a fervent devotee and an amateur theologian, and his book against Luther gained for him from the Pope in 1521 the proud title of defender of the faith a very few years suffice to work revolutionary changes but it may be worth while to endeavour to form an idea of what was really the local situation at the date that has just been named the town for it had not become a city was extremely limited in area and does not appear to have much increased in population during the previous two hundred years having in the meanwhile been frightfully ravaged by the black death and the plague it may be broadly described as being bounded by dolphin street and temple street on the east the course of the Froom along broadmead to st augustine's back on the north and west and the town wall between redcliffe and temple gates on the south around all this boundary line were institutions independent of corporate jurisdiction the royal castle with its extensive fortified precincts and the church and monastic buildings of the black friars lay on the east the priory of st james and its adjoining farmlands covered a vast space on the north the grey friary the nunnery of st mary magdalene the hospital of st bartholomew the carmelite friary the hospital of the gaunts and the abbey of st augustine each enclosing wide areas round their respective churches and houses entirely surrounded the north-western side of the borough while the hospital of st john the baptist and the augustian friary lying to the south continued the circuit to temple fee belonging to the military monks of st john who repudiated the civic jurisdiction claimed by the corporation there was thus no room for suburbs outside the walls even if there had been a desire for them but there is no evidence to show that the townsfolk felt any objection to the ecclesiastical circumvaliation many of their wills attest rather than satisfaction at the multitude of their ghostly comforters a few years later seven of the monkish churches around the city had been swept away and half of two others was demolished but though there was a rush to get a share of the royal plunder few additional dwellings were reared on the vacant sites until a much later date another peculiarity arising from the then national faith was the remarkable number of public holidays a chronicler of the fifteenth century observed that in the agricultural districts the aggregate number of holidays accounted for eight weeks in every year 
the total can hardly have been so large in trading towns but it was still very notable great church festivals called red letter days were of frequent occurrence when attendance at morning service was obligatory and as businesses of all kinds were suspended for a general possession of the civic body it is unlikely that much work was done in the afternoon many wealthy bristolians again had bequeathed large sums for the establishment of what were called chantries in the parish churches where in addition to daily prayers for the founders souls by the chaplain or chaplains supported by each endowment a grand anniversary service called an obit was held yearly attracting a vast attendance of all classes in fifteen forty eight when these endowments were seized for the profit of the crown an inquiry was held in bristol by the royal commissioners to ascertain the value of the local estates the amount reported by them was probably grossly underestimated for one of the inquisitors a notorious gambler afterwards hanged named partridge forestalled all the would-be purchasers by obtaining from his employers the government a grant of the entire property while a congenial colleague sir william sherrington master of the bristol mint who confessed in the following year to have committed enormous frauds in coining base money lent partridge the purchase money and took fully one half of the spoil as his own reward even if the value of the estates were justly rendered the total three hundred and sixty pounds per annum was equivalent to ten times that amount in modern currency the chantries of everard le french and william canninge in st nicholas and redcliffe churches were returned as of the yearly value of over thirty three pounds each and supported four priests who had no other duties to perform a rich merchant named knapp not only founded a chantry with two priests but built a special chapel for it dedicated to st john on the welsh back the site of which is now a little playground about twenty other chantries had at least one priest each independent of the parish incumbents and if we add about thirty friars who held daily services in their four churches but were all paid for taking part in general possessions the number of available clergymen in the town four hundred years ago exclusive of the numerous monks in two large monasteries must have far exceeded the staff of the ancient parishes in the present day it remains to be seen how these institutions affected public holidays an anniversary orbit took place on the average about once in three weeks all the year round and potent means for securing the attendance of the townsfolk had been taken by the chantry founders as a fair example of the general custom to secure the presence of the mayor and corporation in full estate the proctors of helwy's chantry in all saints church were directed to pay six shillings eight dimes to the mayor three shillings four dimes to each of the sheriffs is to the town clerk four dimes to the sword bearer and three dimes each to the four civic sergeants while to allure the working classes a silver penny was given to each of six hundred persons about one-fifth of the adult population when the chantry was established and when the daily wage of an unskilled labourer did not exceed the amount of the dole. It is not surprising that work came to a standstill when an attractive street spectacle was backed up by the prospect of pecuniary profit. Besides the orbits, there were various occasional pageants, some religious, some secular. About Whitsuntide, the guilds of weavers and cordwainers nearly went in pompous way to the chapel of saint annie in the wood near brisington a spot greatly frequented by pilgrims and more than once visited by royalty to place before the altar two gigantic candles 
alleged by William of Worcestershire to have been of a somewhat incredible length of eighty feet each, and to have cost no less than five pounds, equal to the quarterly wages of the mayor. A few weeks before midsummer brought round the feast of Corpus Christi, one of the greatest holidays of the year. The members of every guild, and practically every Bristolian belonged to a guild, assembled with music, flags, and banners to join in the splendid ecclesiastical procession through the streets, where the houses were decorated with tapestry, brilliant cloth, and garlands of flowers, and the afternoon was spent in the performance in the open air of miracle plays, in which every craft claimed its special part to be the enjoyment of the whole community. The excitement caused by this festival can have scarcely subsided before the inhabitants were called upon to participate in the corporate parade called the setting of the watch on Midsummer's Eve. In imitation of a similar ceremony in London, which cost an enormous sum yearly, the members of the chief trade companies who emulated each other in the display of gay dresses, banners, burning cressets and torches and in the supply of minstrels and musical instruments, marched in procession through the streets, the proceedings terminating in morris dancing and various games, in which the populace participated. The corporation left the chief expenditure of the day to be defrayed by the guilds, but provided a hundred and fourteen gallons of wine, presumably for the subsequent suppers of the companies, the weavers and tuckers receiving ten gallons each, whilst the remainder was distributed amongst the other twenty-six fraternities. When the streets were muddy, and they were rarely otherwise, the city treasurer also paid the cost of covering them with twenty or thirty tons of sand. Another civic outlay of the day is somewhat puzzling. It would appear that the procession ended, and the sports began upon Bristol Bridge, and to that spot a great quantity of nettles cut down in the marsh, Queen Square, were invariably transported beforehand at the corporate charge. The only plausible conjecture that can be suggested to explain this outlay is that the stinging plants were provided for a rough and tumble scuffle. Another setting of the watch, of a precisely similar character, nettles included, took place on St. Peter's Day in August. The eve of St. Catherine in November was the most notable festival of the weavers, then the leading and most numerous local handicraft. According to the mayor's calendar, written about 1490, the mayor and members of the corporation, after having been entertained in the weavers' hall near Temple Church on spiced cake, bread and wine, the cups merrily filled about the house, returned to their homes, ready to receive at their doors St. Catherine's players, making them to drink at their doors, and rewarding them for their plays, which must thus have been performed in the open streets. A grand procession through all the thoroughfares took place on the following morning. The corporation also made provisions for various outdoor sports, Extensive butts were maintained in the marsh for the practice of archery, which was then obligatory on all capable of bearing arms, and the place was largely resorted to by bowmen on Sunday afternoons in the summer months. In July a day was set apart for wrestling matches in the marsh, and another and more popular competition of the same sort between townsmen and countrymen took place at Lawrencetide. In August, at Lawrence Hill, a prize of six shillings, eight dimes, being given out the city purse on each occasion, as the second display required the corporate body to march a mile into the country, a modest quencher became, of course, indispensable, and in 1532 the city fathers disposed of six and a half gallons of wine, costing five shillings, four dimes, more for bread, one dime, pears, two shillings, four dimes. The bill for wine and fruit was slightly varied 
in subsequent years but the penny for bread was a fixed quantity whatever might be the consumption of liquor in fifteen forty three there was a slight hitch in the arrangements explained in the accounts as follows paid the wrestlers on both sides four shillings the old custom was six shillings four dimes but for because the countryside brought not a goose according to the old custom therefore was paid about four shillings spent upon them at lafford's gate to smooth matters over four dimes soon after this wrestling competition in the worshipful mayor and his brethren suspended business at the tolsey and gave themselves a holiday in order to enjoy the cheerful sport of fishing in the foom in the presence of crowds of spectators as sometimes as much as four shillings were paid to the men that went into the water a large staff must have been employed to drag the nets the catch must also have been generally good for on one occasion the mayor was paid ten shillings because he did not go a fishing other causes of distraction from work came from outside the city in the shape of travelling companies of play actors and bear keepers the king and several noblemen maintained these parties of strangers who were allowed to travel about the country when they were not required at court and were always welcome in fifteen thirty two the corporation gave ten shillings to the players of lord lyle and six shillings six dimes to those of the duke of richmond the king's illegitimate son whom henry once contemplated to proclaim heir to the throne in the same year from three shillings four dimes to five shillings each were bestowed on the bare wards of the duke of suffolk lord westmoreland and the duke of richmond bear baiting and ball baiting were two of the most favourite sports of the age and as unlike the drama they could be witnessed free of expense every exhibition attracted thousands of working men the civic ceremony which seems the most extraordinary to modern ideas was that which took place on december the sixth the feast of st nicholas at this festival a boy doubtless one of the servitors of the parish priests was solemnly instituted as a bishop and having been clothed in episcopal vestments delivered a sermon in st nicholas's church before the mayor and common council on whom he gravely pronounced his blessing and then says the mayor's calendar the spelling of which we modernize after dinner the said mayor sheriff and their brethren to assemble at the mayor's compter there waiting the bishops coming playing the meanwhiles at dice the town clerk to find them dice and to have one penny of every raffle and when the bishop is come thither his chapel there to sing and the bishop to give them his blessings and then he and all his chapel to be served there with bread and wine and so depart the mayor sheriff and their brethren to hear the bishop's evensong at st nicholas church the ceremony of the boy bishop was of ancient date and was practised in all parts of the kingdom in twelve ninety nine edward the first rewarded one of these mock prelates at newcastle with a sum now equivalent to forty pounds but conceived the bristol council of our day solemnly assembled to receive a madrigal boy be figged as a bishop whiling away their time with the dice box which the town clerk on the lookout for his fee had at hand for the lord mayor and making four processions through the crowded streets to and from sham services at st nicholas it is perhaps hardly fair to include public executions in the list of holidays and yet they unquestionably filled the streets with non-workers they occurred once and sometimes twice every year as a certain issue of the season and there is always a small payment for carrying the ladder to and from st michael's hill there being no carts in bristol the unhappy convicts had to make their long journey from newgate to cotton on foot and were swung off the ladder by the hungman finally during christmas week 
the lord of misrule was in full supremacy and holiday keeping generally extended from christmas eve to twelfth night a day or two before the festies the mayor for the sake of public order made public proclamation that no inhabitant gentle or simple should go about murmuring with masked faces at night after the tolling of the curfew bell unless he carried a torch lantern candle or sconce and that no one should wear weapons by night or by day on pain of fine or imprisonment in a season of universal license it may be questioned whether much heed was paid to the regulations it was the season of unlimited guzzling the city magnates setting the example by an ordinance of the common council in 1472 the mayor's christmas drinking was fixed to take place on st stephen's day december the twenty sixth the sheriff's drinking on st john's day december the twenty seventh the senior bailiff's drinking on innocence day december the twenty eighth and that of the junior bailiff on new year's day and on twelfth day to go to the christmas drinking of the abbot of st augustine as of old custom if it be prayed by the abbot and convent end of chapter one chapter two of sixteenth century bristol by john latimer this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 On the cursory examination of the corporate account books in the middle of Henry VIII's reign, the income and expenditure of the civic body appeared to be marvellously insignificant as compared with the importance and reputation of the port and borough. In the year ending Michaelmas 1536, for example, the total receipts of the Chamberlain, Treasurer, are stated to have been a hundred and eighty six pounds, eight shillings, eleven and a half dimes, whilst his outlay was no more than a hundred and sixty one pounds, ten shillings, one dime. Further examination, however, reveals the fact that this official was the recipient of a little more than the waifs and strays of the corporate revenue, and that the chief financial business was in the hands of the sheriffs whose accounts have not been preserved in the council house the true state of affairs is revealed in an elaborate document addressed to all the powerful ministers cardinal holsey by william dell one of the sheriffs elected in fifteen eighteen complaining of the manner in which he and his colleague like all previous sheriffs had been victimized by the common council according to the detailed figures which he sent forth which must be multiplied by twelve to represent the currency of modern days the trivial income including sixty pounds received from the chamber was two hundred and thirty two pounds ten shillings and eight dimes on the other hand the sheriffs were required to pay the fee farm of the town yearly due to the crown which with subsidiary expenses amounting to a hundred and seventy two pounds to furnish the mayor with his pension of twenty pounds to provide his worship with a splendid robe of scarlet and fur wine minstrels and many other items costing altogether thirty seven pounds to disperse all the charges for watches wrestling bear baitings and christmas drinkings referred to in the previous chapter which with other like matters involved an outlay of over forty six pounds to pay the salaries of the recorder town clerk town steward town attorney priest of st george's chapel porters of the town gates and minor corporate officials and to bedeck the whole of them with robes at a total outlay of over a hundred pounds to defray the cost of this season's twelve pounds to pay the wages of the members of parliament for the city when at westminster two shillings per day each to keep in order st nicholas clock to give dolls to the four orders of friars etc the aggregate outlay amounting to over three hundred seventy eight pounds mr dale and his companion were thus out of pocket 
a hundred and forty six pounds exclusive of two hundred and forty pounds alleged to be both sheriff's expenses and cost of household and the apparel of them and their wives the common council were highly indignant at these revelations and warmly protested that the expenditure of the sheriffs was in accordance with ancient custom and that the charges alleged to be partially exaggerated and partially due to high and progenial minds might well be borne by prosperous men in consideration of the worshipful dignity conferred upon them the cardinal nevertheless commanded a reform of the system and in fifteen nineteen the corporation doubtless much against its will made due arrangements the allowance of sixty pounds to the sheriffs were discontinued but the dues derived from shipping entering the port then amounting to nearly eighty three pounds were thenceforth to be received by the sheriffs together with the tolls collected at the town gates fifty seven pounds their customary income derived from the great st james's friar twenty three pounds from law fines and fortitures thirty pounds and twelve pounds the profits of the gaol for strange to say the gaol was a profitable institution were to be retained and a few trifling items raised the shrivel income to two hundred and fifteen pounds as regarded the expenditure the sheriffs were relieved from the expense of the mayor's pension and robes and from the wages but not from the robes of the recorder and city officers whilst a few charges for wrestling drinkings etc were also transferred to the chamber their total expenditure being thus cut down to two hundred seventy three pounds being still an excessive over income of fifty eight pounds subsequent sheriffs must nevertheless have been grateful to mr dell and the cardinal the custom of demanding toll at the town gates on goods entering or leaving a fortified borough was originally established for the purpose of maintaining the walls and was probably universal in the middle ages even to the present day the corporation of newcastle derives a great yearly income from this source and the proceeds of the octroi at paris meet the ordinary outlay of the municipality the system however was very unpopular in bristol and the complaints of the inhabitants eventually accumulated in scenes of violence in fifteen forty six a happy thought suggested itself to some worthy citizen and was received with general applause as need hardly be stated the then recent suppression of the monasteries had led to the seizure by the crown of an almost fabulous amount of wealth in the shape of gold and silver plate many cartloads of such treasure having been secured at canterbury durham and york and vast quantities in the wealthier abbeys in the year just named the government had already turned a covetous eye on the chantries in the cathedrals and parish churches which with many free chapels were upwards of two thousand three hundred in number and there was ample reason for suspecting that the churches themselves which were richly stored with valuables in the shape of processional crosses monstrances incense boxes fibules and eucharistic vessels would not long escape spoliation now the corporation had succeeded in obtaining from the king in fifteen forty an extensive grant of the estates of the dissolved religious houses and a further grant in fifteen forty four of properties in bristol to be referred to presently but had been forced to borrow the purchase monies one thousand seven hundred and ninety pounds and was in painful financial straits the propounder of the brilliant idea just referred to suggested that the parochial vestries should offer the corporation a quantity of plate sufficient to pay off a large portion of its liabilities on condition of its surrendering its rights to levy tolls the proposal having been approved by fourteen out of the seventeen city parishes and eagerly accepted by the common council the accounts of the sheriffs for the previous ten years were examined to ascertain the amount received at the gates and also the sum collected in the shape of dues on victuals and grain of all kinds wool 
yarn, and flannel brought to the quays by ships. In the result, a net sum of £44 per annum was settled upon as adequate compensation to be paid by the council to the sheriffs for the abolition of the tolls and dues. The fourteen vestries thereupon produced plate to the value of five hundred and twenty three pounds ten shillings and eight dimes, taking security from the corporation to be borne harmless in case the treasure should be thereafter claimed by the crown. By the aid of this handsome gift, the civic body overcame its pecuniary embarrassments and entered into full possession of the estates of Gaunt's Hospital save the rich manor of Paulet in Somerset, the Bristol houses of the Grey and Carmelite Friars, the manor of Hamp, formerly belonging to Athelney Abbey, and a slice of land, previously the property of the Magdalen Nunnery on St. Michael's Hill, for all which the Crown had received a thousand pounds, and also of the Bristol properties still to be described. The country estates of Gaunt's Hospital were sold in 1836 for nearly £60,000. Colston Hall and the property in the rear, including the Red Lodge, represented the site of the Carmelite Friary. On June 14, 1546, a formal agreement was drawn up between the corporation and the discreet and loving burgesses, whereby it was declared that, after due deliberation of the disquietness created by the tolls, the perjuries and blasphemies caused by them, and the evil slanders against the city thereby arising, and in further consideration of the future good of the city, and of those resorting to it, all the gates should be thenceforth freed from all manner of tolls, and that no shipping dues should be levied on the goods and wares mentioned above. The relief from an oppression burden was proclaimed at the high cross admits general rejoicing not the slightest allusion is to be found in the corporate account books to the purchase from the crown or to the contributions of the parishes the transactions were doubtless dealt with in a separate volume since lost certain church plate probably from st mark's church mayor's chapel was carried to the council house in order to be sent to london and sixteen dimes were spent for beer, ale, and wine, drank when the plate was counted and packed into baskets for the carrier. But no time was lost in turning the acquired property to account. The friary buildings were at once converted into quarries, paid two men for choosing out of the friars certain paving stones to pave withal, two shillings six dimes, hundreds of sledge loads of stone including chimney-pieces and other ornamental work, were afterwards drawn from thence for building purposes. As the gross rents of the monastic estates amounted to £266 in 1548, when they make their first appearance in the audit book, it is clear that the purchase produced an enormous return from the outset. The second royal grant to the corporation was of much less value than the first, but it definitely settled a controversy that had been a chronic trouble for many generations. Early in the twelfth century, Robert Fitzroy, Earl of Gloucestershire, Lord of the Great Manor of Bedminster, which then extended to Bristol Bridge, granted to the Order of Templars a portion of the borough of Redcliffe, which served portion was thenceforth known as Temple Fee. On the ruthless destruction of the Templars in the reign of Edward the Second, this fee was part of the estate which the king conferred on the knights of St. John of Jerusalem, and formed part of their preceptory of Temple Coombe. The new owners, like their predecessors, were empowered to hold their own courts, to execute felons, and to exercise all other feudal privileges in their domains independent of the ordinary authorities when redcliffe became incorporated with bristol the attempts of the corporation to extend their jurisdiction over temple fee which seems to have become a refuge for outlaws were strongly resisted by order of the non-resident knights and civic officials pursuing malefactors 
appeared to have frequently returned with empty hands and broken heads. In 1532, when the contest for jurisdiction was in one of its acute stages, a member of the order styled the Knight of Rhodes, in the corporate accounts, paid a visit to Bristol to discuss the matter, and was entertained by the city with two gallons of wine and a quantity of sweetmeats without anything being gained by the expenditure. No settlement being effected, the respective parties appealed to the king, the prior of St. John, who had a seat in the House of Lords, alleging that Temple Street, as part of the fee, enjoyed liberty of sanctuary for felons and murderers, and that his tenants there had a right to buy and sell, though not burgess of Bristol, claiming also to hold courts and to have the return and execution of writs, all which privileges were denied by the corporation. The king referred the dispute to two of the superior judges, who, after hearing evidence, adjudged in 1535 that the civic officers had a right to arrest felons in the fee and to execute writs, but postponed the decision on other points. Troubles with the military monks came to a summary end in 1541, when their possessions were confiscated. In 1544, the corporation petitioned the king for a grant of the lands, quit rents, etc., of the fee, and the adversary of Temple Church estimating the yearly value at fourteen pounds seven shillings eleven dimes. They also prayed to be granted the estate in Bristol, then lately belonging to Viscount Lyle, but fallen into the king's hands, the annual value being estimated at fifty seven pounds eight shillings three dimes. His Majesty assented to the request and granted both the estates in consideration of a payment of seven hundred and eighty nine pounds seventeen shillings ten dimes. The above estimates of value are shown to have been pretty accurate by the civic audit book for fifteen forty eight, in which the properties make their first appearance. The rents had produced ninety four pounds, reduced to about sixty eight pounds by outlay for repairs. The corporate estates were not secured by a simple payment of the king's demands for their concession. The civil government of the country, after the fall of Wolsey, fell into the hands of Thomas Cromwell, whose insatiable rapacity was phenomenal even in its own time. The astonishing results are to be read in the state papers of the reign. It came to be universally understood that any claim, however just, and petition, however reasonable, addressed to the depotic monarch, was doomed to certain rejection unless favoured by the minister, and that such favour was hopeless unless purchased by a bribe. A golden stream flowing from all ranks accordingly set in and yearly increased. Even before the monasteries were threatened, abbots and priors varied with each other in showering gratifications on the dreaded secretary. When they fell and the court was besieged by innumerable suitors, for a share in the gigantic spoil, the flood of money that poured into the vicar general's coffers must have astounded even himself. A characteristic example of his unscrupulousness occurred shortly before his fall. In August 1539, Grinlyams, the last abbot of St. Augustine's, transmitted him a bribe of a hundred pounds to secure the royal confirmation to that office which he was forced to surrender only four months later. The corporation of Bristol took a just measure of Cromwell's character at an early date. In 1533, the office of the corder falling vacant, it was conferred upon the secretary as a sinecure, bringing in £20 a year, and securing his countenance, which was the one thing needful. It may be safely assumed that a larger gratification had to be offered to him when the negotiation was opened for the gaunt estates, but the records have disappeared. The royal grant had passed the general seal only a few weeks when Cromwell, having served his master's purpose, met with the customary fate of Tudor instruments. The following entries occur in the civic account book for 1540. Paid to the Lord Privy Seal 
by the hands of Mr. Davy Broke, recorder, twenty pounds. For as much, the twenty pounds charge paid to the Lord Essex, late recorder, for his fee due to him at the Feast of the Nativity, 1540, which accustomedly was used to be then paid at one time, and for that this said Lord of Essex was beheaded before the said feast in the said year. We, the auditors, find that the twenty pounds ought not to be allowed in this account. How this little difficulty was settled does not appear. The fall of Cromwell was followed by the rise of another ignoble and greedy tool of despotism. Edward, brother of Queen Jane Seymour, created Earl of Hertford and Duke of Somerset, who afterwards unspurred the place of Lord Proctor. Seymour had Bristol blood in his veins, and the corporation, with its usual predilection for a powerful friend at court, invited the office of Lord High Steward, endowed it with a yearly fee of four pounds, and presented it to the rising luminary. Soon after the death of Henry the Eighth, Somerset and his Mildredums laid hands on the chantries in the manner narrated in the previous chapter, and the protector paid a visit to Bristol to watch local operations. His inquisitorial commissions reached the city about the same time, and were profusely entertained by the corporation, with which a sharp eye for consciences presented the Lord High Steward with his fee, accompanied by two butts of wine, and paid the charges of his retinue. The results proved highly satisfactory. The chantries, with all their estates and effects, were, of course, entirely swallowed up. The Merchant Ventures Chapel of St. Clement, the Weaver's Chapel of St. Catherine, the Tailor's Chapel of St. John, and Mac's Chapel on the back, were suppressed, and the contents confiscated. Services at the chapel of St. George in the Guildhall were stopped, and the image of the patron saint was torn down. The chapel of the three kings of Colling at Christmas Steps and Trinity Chapel in the Old Market, both attached to almshouses, of which the corporation were trustees, were not included in the sale of the chantry estates. The commissioners, however, decreed that they were the property of the crown, and ordered the confiscation of so much of each of the hospital estates as was equivalent in yearly value to the stipend of each of the dispossessed chaplains, about six pounds. This decision appears to have been long overlooked, but it was discovered in 1577 by two legal sharpers who forthwith procured a grant of the two chapels and the reserved lands from Queen Elizabeth. The grantees then came down upon the corporation, who were compelled to submit to their terms, and who paid them sixty-six pounds thirteen shillings four dimes for a transfer of the Queen's conveyance. The chapel of St. Mary on Bristol Bridge, which the adjoining dwelling of the priest was bestowed upon the corporate body, through the estates of the fabric, went with the rest of the chantries. The transaction is recorded in the audit book paid to the king for the purchase of the site with the priest's chamber and the lead with all the appurtenances belonging to the same forty pounds more to the king for the bells and all the vestments and implements eleven pounds there were however large incidental expenses several journeys had to be made to london to get the grant passed in due form the lord chancellor had to be paid for the patent the Lord Privy Seal had to be feed for the signet, and gratitudes had to be offered to court underlings, scribes, and attorneys, the total expenditure being thereby raised to nearly eighty-eight pounds. But on the other hand, the proctors and auditors of the chapel paid over funds in hand, of which it may be safely suspected the royal agents had been kept in the dark, amounting in round figures to fifty-five pounds. The bells and implements sold for eleven pounds, and one Mrs. Compton paid six pounds thirteen shillings four dimes for the consideration that Sir Thomas, her kinsman, might be admitted to the same service, that is, be appointed chaplain, which he possibly was for life. 
the actual outlay by the corporation was thus reduced to a few pounds. The chapel extended right across the bridge, being erected over an archway similar to that of St. John's Church in Broad Street. In 1553, another gang of spoilers were nominated by the government to confiscate the plate of all the churches in the kingdom, and Bristolians had good reason to congratulate themselves on their proceedings in 1546. With the exception of two small chalices in the cathedral, and one in each of the parish churches which were ordered safely and surely to be kept for the king's majesty's use, every precious article was carried off together with most of the parochial bells the cathedral was deprived of five great bells and nearly a hundred and thirty tons of lead roofing the returns as to the quantity of plate actually seized have perished but some consumption of the total may be arrived at by recorded facts relating to st nicholas's church when the prayer called gifts were made to procure the freedom of the gates, this church possessed 694 ounces of silver ornaments, and the vestry contributed for six pounds, fifteen shillings, which, at five shillings, six dimes per ounce, the current value of silver bullion would represent 170 ounces. The commissioners, therefore, swept off the remaining 524 ounces, less one chalice of fifteen ounces left in parish. As regards All Saints Church, a document is in existence proving that 420 ounces were taken thence to the Bristol Mint. These were probably the two wealthiest parishes in the city, but even the little parish of St. Leonard was despoiled of 222 ounces, and it may be fairly assumed that the aggregate spoil from the cathedral and the seventeen parochial churches must have reached about five thousand ounces of silver to say nothing of the value of the lead and bells the plate was probably removed to the local mint and converted into base money the shillings coined by sharrington being intrinsically worth about three pence End of chapter two Chapter Three of Sixteenth Century Bristol by John Latimer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three. To modern readers, the most interesting fact preserved in the state papers in relation to the local chantries is the numbering of the inhabitants of Bristol, which they luckily record. The royal mandate to the chantry commissioners required the church wardens not only to produce a detailed account of the yearly proceeds of each chantry estate but also to return the number of inhabitants dwelling in each parish and this census accordingly stands at the head of each parochial report whatever may have been the knavery of the commissioners in underestimating for the benefit of two of themselves the value of the confiscated property neither the visitors nor the local authorities had any inducement to misrepresent the actual population of a city in a few parishes the numbering seems to have been made with scrupulous exactness in others the round figures shows that the church wardens were content to offer an approximate estimate of the housing people living within their respective boundaries but it is unlikely that any of their returns were intentionally magnified or diminished, for no purpose could be served by false location. The following are the figures. Parish of St. Werburgh, 160. St. James, 520. St. Thomas, 600. St. Philip, 514. St. John, 227. St. Nicholas, eight hundred saint peter four hundred christchurch three hundred and twenty six saint stephen four hundred and sixty one saint mary redcliffe six hundred all saints one hundred and eighty temple four hundred and eighty saint ewan fifty six saint leonard a hundred and twenty saint michael two hundred and fifty two 
St. Mary Le Port, 180, with a total of 5,876. As there were no chantries in St. Augustine the Less, which had been a dependency of the neighbouring abbey, a census of that parish does not appear. The number of inhabitants, however, must have been inconsiderable, for with the exception of a fringe of dwellings at and near St. Augustine's Back, College Green, Frog Lane, and Limekiln Road, the district was divided into grassland and garden ground. Thus, the total population of the city apparently did not much exceed 6,000. Similar returns for the city of Gloucester show an aggregate population of 3,159. One seeks in vain for definite information as to the police and sanitary arrangements that were in force at the date of the above census. In 1508, the corporation passed an ordinance declaring that the mayor, two older men, and the forty men, common councillors, were entitled to levy dues on the goods of the townsmen as well as on rents as on merchandise. But this power seems to have been exercised only on great emergencies, and, if the audit books may be trusted, local rates in the modern sense were unknown. The paving of the chief thoroughfares was compulsory on the owners of the frontage, each maintaining the surface of the street as far as the central gutter. The lighting of the streets at night was never dreamt of. Such scavenging as was thought indispensable was long undertaken by a single individual who sought his remuneration from the good will of the householders. But in 1543 the Common Council resolved to pay this public servant 16 dimes per week, or 20 shillings per quarter, and as the luckless raker could not live on this stipend and continued his perquisitions, he was afterwards voted 12 shillings a year extra, because he shall take no toll. In 1557 the council increased his salary to 12 pounds per annum, but relief from this charge was immediately secured by ordering a collection to be made from the citizens. It is not stated on what basis the money was levied, but the whole outlay was brought in, and the only corporate disimbursement was two pence weekly for keeping the front of the council house and guild hall in decent order. Even a parsimonious trader could hardly have grumbled at having to contribute some small fraction of a penny towards raising four shillings six times a week. About the same date, the civic body laid out three shillings eight dimes for a lantern to hang at Froom Gate, and there is also mention of a lantern at the High Cross. But no payment occurs for candles, except occasionally on the midsummer watch night, when sixpence might be laid out for tapers at the cross. Mendicants becoming increasingly troublesome. A new official, styled the Master of the Beggars, was appointed in 1532 and provided with a yearly coat and a modest salary of three shillings four dimes per quarter, subsequently raised to five shillings, from which one must infer that he was employed rather for occasional show than for daily use. Mendicity, indeed, was not merely tolerated before the invention of poor rates, but actually patronised by the corporation. The following items occur in the audit book under March 1571. Paid for graving a mould of the tang's arms to cast in tin for forty badges, to set upon twenty poor people to go into Somerset to seek relief, two shillings, seven pounds tin to cast them, four shillings, eight dimes cast in and making holes whereby they might be sewed upon their backs and breasts, two shillings, six dimes, thread, one dime. Finally, the provisions for the suppression of crime and for the preservation of good order were ludicrously feeble. 
the corporation maintained a staff of four sergeants remunerated by fees but these officers were not in attendance upon the magistrates as they were expected to be daily were largely employed in the legal business arising out of civil actions in the mayor's and sheriff's court and naturally shirked all duties that offered no prospect of remuneration parish constables again were selected yearly one half at the midsummer watch and the other on st peter's day from the able-bodied residents of each ward but they rarely undertook active service except when specially summoned to quell disturbances and casual brawls were left to settle themselves when a male factor was not caught in the act or left no traces of his identity he had evidently little to fear in the shape of detection and retribution one or two corporate ordinances presumably intended to promote the health and safety of the public may be briefly noted there is a current legend that the hop plant came into england with the reformation but it was used by bristol brewers in the reign of henry the seventh to the discontent of the common council who issued an edict in fifteen o five forbidding hops to be put into ale except in the months of june july and august on pain of a penalty of forty shillings and apparently to detect infringements of this order an l connor was appointed in fifteen nineteen who was ordered to go boldly into every brewer's premises to taste his ale and if it was found unwholesome to forbid its sale a few years later this officer was deemed so useful that two connors were appointed with a joint yearly salary of one pound six shillings and eight dimes it was not until fifteen seventy four that an ordinance was enacted forbidding the use of thatch for roofing houses and other buildings in the city soon after the corporation had obtained the royal grant of the chapel on bristol bridge it undertook a work of some importance the construction of two houses on the same thoroughfare of a character far surpassing the customary style of tradesmen's dwellings which rarely exceeded two stories in height the project seems to have been instigated by the receipt of a legacy of one hundred pounds bequeathed for public purpose by one thomas hart and by the payment of one half of a similar bequest of forty pounds left by thomas silk moved by a somewhat cool appeal for further assistance to carry out the design alderman thomas white of london a member of a bristol family remarkable for its liberal benefactions to the city generously presented another one hundred pounds with these funds in hand the common council in fifteen forty eight gave orders for beginning the work which was executed by workmen paid weekly by the chamberlain as the houses were to be chiefly of wood a carpenter was brought down from london as superintendent and was paid one shilling per day the local workmen receiving eight pence and the labourers five pence per head the first order for timber brought in seventeen large trees and many more were required subsequently the chimneys and fireplaces were of brick which appears to have been imported and was costly two parcels costing thirty eight pounds the bricklayer was paid one shilling per day some old glass was made available and two hundred and fifty eight feet of new glass cost the high price of sixpence per foot two of the friaries were pillaged for some ornamental stonework probably owing to the workmen being left much to their own devices the building operations extended over eighty-six weeks and the total expenditure was no less than four hundred and ninety-five pounds thirteen shillings and four dimes an extraordinary sum for that period the houses were let for six pounds thirteen shillings and four dimes each in fifteen fifty one in which year the corporation which had just rebuilt the tolsey in corn street 
as a council house set about the erection of a block of warehouses in the old Drury. The locality inhabited by the Bristol Jews previous to their expulsion from England in 2090, and now represented by part of the buildings standing between Bell Lane and Key Street. The outlay of this undertaking was £470. The cost of the new Tolsey or council house cannot be ascertained. End of chapter 3chapter four of sixteenth century bristol by john latimer this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four a sketch of corporate transactions down to the middle of the sixteenth century given in the three previous chapters has chiefly dealt with subjects relating to the internal affairs of the city before proceeding further a few matters may be noticed in which the common council were acted upon by outside influences. Feudal privileges, for example, though decaying, were by no means extinct. There were still many manors in Gloucestershire, in which the labouring population were serfs attached to the soil they cultivated, and liable to be transferred with the soil from one owner to another. Many Bristolians living at the accession of Henry the Eighth must have remembered that, less than thirty years previously, Lord de la Roire, an opulent local landowner, had threatened to recover as one of his bondsmen a rich merchant, William Bird, who had served the offices of mayor and sheriff of the town. His lordship, claiming the right to treat the aged gentleman as a runaway beast, to take possession of his property, and to appropriate his family as villains happily mr bird was able to prove beyond dispute that though his grandfather had lived for some years on one of de la Warre's manors where his children were born his ancestors had dwelt in birmingham as free men for many generations and upon the corporation taking action on behalf of a valued colleague the peer found it prudent to abandon his claim the threat was, in fact, preposterous. It being one of the immemorable privileges of Bristol that a countryman who had lived for a year and a day within the walls was a townsman, and entitled to permanent protection. The issue was recorded in the Great Red Book at the Council House by a remembrance to be had in perpetual memory for a president to all slanderous persons having their tongues more prompter to speak wickedly than to say truth interference on the part of royalty was a more serious matter queen anne boleyn during the brief period of her favour followed the example of the courtiers around her who habitually sold what influence they possessed to those willing to buy it in january fifteen thirty four her majesty addressed what was practically a mandate to the mayor and corporation, requiring them to confer the next presentation of the mastership of St. John's Hospital at Redcliffe, of which they were patrons, upon two officers of her household, and David Hutton of Bristol, grocer, stating that they would appoint a fitting person when the office became vacant. The corporation obeyed the command with great alacrity the grant of the presentation to the queen's nominees being made only four days after the date of her letter whether mr hutton who was doubtless the prompter of the transaction got his money's worth for his money is a matter of conjecture he was a man of good position and had served the office of sheriff probably in consequence of this transaction the common council passed an ordinance in fifteen fifty one forbidding any member suing the crown for any office in the gift of the city on pain of being dismissed and disfranchised before dealing with the fate of the hospital a further reference must be made to the queen in fifteen thirty five the king paid a visit to thornby castle one of the fine estates of the duke of buckingham whose judicial murder a few years earlier 
had been mainly determined upon and ruthlessly perpetrated for the sake of cutting off a nobleman whose royal descent was a standing menace whilst there were no male heir to the crown and whose vast possessions aroused the greed of an unscrupulous despot henry was accompanied by his second consort and they purposed to pay a visit to bristol but had to abandon that project through a deadly outbreak of the plague the corporation manifested much anxiety to appropriate their formidable sovereign ten fat oxen and forty sheep were forwarded to plenish the royal larder and queen anne was presented with a massive gilt cup containing one hundred marks in gold as the offering of the queen's chamber the title proudly claimed for bristol the gay recipient then little imagined that she was within nine months of her doom reverting to st john's hospital it would appear that the mastership did not fall vacant until fifteen forty two when one greenfield presumably hutton's nominee was appointed but the institution was suppressed and its estates confiscated in march fifteen forty four the corporation immediately attempted to obtain a grant of the spoil a deputation was sent up to court and the members of parliament rendered earnest assistance the expenses of the chamberlain during this negotiation appeared in the audit book and afforded a striking illustration of the cheapness of travelling at that period the officer and his man were absent fifteen days and the total outlay for their maintenance and that of their horses at inns on the road and in london was thirty-eight shillings eight dimes being less than one shilling three and a half dimes per day for each man and his horse the hire of two horses cost eleven shillings or four and a half dime per horse per day the servants wages were five shillings or four dime per day and a special breakfast for the city members for their pains at a london tavern cost four and a half dimes per head the corporate efforts were fruitless the king gave the hospital and all its belongings to his physician george owen the worthy doctor however seems to have had some compunction in appropriating a charitable foundation for in fifteen fifty three he granted the corporation a ninety nine years lease of numerous houses in bristol and one hundred and thirty acres of land at chew magna formerly belonging to the hospital in trust to maintain ten additional inmates in foster's almshouses at a cost of about fifteen pounds a year at a later date the corporation purchased the fee simple of this estate from owen's representative and in recent years the rents have brought in one thousand five hundred pounds a year to the charity trustees one-sixth of the proceedings being credited to foster's almshouses and the remainder to the grammar school one of the most vexatious and most lasting outside troubles of the corporation was the claim of the lord president of the welsh marches to contribution from bristol towards the expenditure of his council the courts of this great official were held at gloucester ludlow or wigmore castles and it was his custom to assume that this city was within his jurisdiction and to summon the mayor to wait upon him and render military service and tribute for the defence of the marches the first recorded instance of this preposterous demand occurs in fifteen forty two when the chamberlain paid fees to two pursuivants bringing commands of this character but no response seems to have been returned in fifteen fifty one a similar mandate was issued by sir william herbert lord president in a more peremptory style and after vainly seeking protection in london the civic body sent a deputation to ludlow to protest against the aggression the result must have been unsatisfactory for further appeals were forthwith made by the corporation to the royal court a butt of wine costing eight pounds ten shillings was ordered to be sent to 
the duke's grace of somerset and thirty-three shillings four dimes was paid for its carriage to london sugar-loaves were forwarded to a judge and two legal officials and directions were given to the city delegates to inquire whether sir henry had any such authority to direct any such commission sent to the mayor or that we were within his principality of the marches and how london was served in this case the lord chancellor at length ordered the issue of a writ of oyer and terminer to settle the question but there is no record of the result in fifteen fifty eight renewed arbitrary injunctions of the president provoked the corporation to vigorous resistance and the chamberlain was sent up to london with a supplication to parliament what was more to the purpose in those days a butt of muscadel of canadia was presented to the lord treasurer whose secretaries and porters and various other underlings were duly gratified and six pounds thirteen shillings was given to the solicitor general for his counsel and friendship the chamberlain was thereby enabled to return in triumph bearing letters of rebuke to the president which submissive courtesy being no longer indispensable was sent to ludlow by a groom only four years later however in fifteen sixty two the claim was raised again in all its former extravagance much to the indignation of the civic body on this occasion after a fruitless effort by the chamberlain from whom the president exhorted thirty shillings for harness pikes and other monishiron the mayor john pikes and some of his brethren went in some pomp to london and spent money so freely yet so judiciously that according to a minute in one of the council house books the citizens were exempted from the marches of wales for ever which before it was great trouble unto them the mayor seized this opportunity to sue queen elizabeth for a charter granting additional privileges to the corporation and this effort for the time unsuccessful doubtless added to the civic outlay which owing to a widespread scattering of gratifications including a black satin robe for the lord chief justice exceeded two hundred pounds even after this crushing defeat the welsh officials had the audacity in fifteen eighty six to again assume suzerainty over bristol but a journey to court on one of the legal advisers of the city possibly aided by gratuities put a final end to the lord president's pretensions in times of sacrosity the common council was accustomed to make purchases of corn for distribution amongst the poor at cost price and had sometimes to go far afield for supplies in fifteen thirty one a quantity of wheat was brought in the upper valley of the severn and was being brought down in boats when on reaching gloucester it was seized by the sheriffs by direction of the mayor who had it sold and coolly retained the proceeds the bristol authorities thereupon appealed to the court of star chamber which forthwith ordered the gloucester officials to deliver at bristol within six weeks as much good wheat as they had appropriated whilst the impudent mayor was summoned to london to answer for his conduct and he and his sheriffs were mulcted in six pounds thirteen shillings four dimes each to be paid to the corporation of bristol the corporative audit books for the first three years of mary's reign have disappeared and we are consequently deprived of information respecting the attitude of the local authorities in reference to the religious reaction of the time the expense of burning unhappy protestants must have fallen upon the civic purse but as the records are lost it is impossible to determine the precise number of victims on which the old calendar writers strangely disagree if it be true and it is probably only too true that the officers who carried out the sentences instead of taking dry faggots from the plentiful stores on the quays brought green wood at redland to increase the agony of the sufferers 
let us hope that the corporation were not responsible for this additional torture the account book for 1557 shows that the king and queen's players and those of the earl of oxford visited the city to offer diversions amidst the prevailing horrors and that the former were paid fifteen shillings and the latter ten shillings for the entertainments it also appears that the corporation had revived the celebration of spencer's orbit in accordance with the original trust but this may have been due to compulsion and the flight of two of the city ministers to escape persecution indicates that in bristol as in london protestant doctrines had taken a deep root the accession of elizabeth which put an end to the reign of terror was held with rejoicings and bonfires and still greater manifestations of joy took place at her coronation paid as a reward to the parson and clerk to sing te duem commanded by the mayor two shillings indicates that the corporation refused to attend mass at the cathedral the civic bodies soon after appealed to their new sovereign for a confirmation of the city charters and after some demur the petition was complied with the huge patent entailing an outlay of about fifty pounds in fees at court the government seems to have speedily taken a new departure in reference to the armed forces of this and other cities the annual muster of the trained bands had been previously a mere form in 1561 after some rusty old armour had been put in order at the expense of the chamber twenty gunners were dressed in uniforms provided with gunpowder paid six shillings eight dimes each as conduct money and ordered off to take part in the general muster of gloucestershire four civic visits were paid to the lord chandos lord lieutenant in the course of the year and he was presented with four hogsheads of wine the inclusion of the bristol force in that of the country however was regarded as the arbitrary the chamberlain was dispatched to london to plead the privileges of the city and by liberal presents to the proper officials including a butt of sack to the earl of pembroke lord high steward of bristol the messenger succeeded in obtaining a pledge that the city should henceforth receive an independent commission thereupon twelve ells of sarsenet red blue and yellow the city colours were brought in london for three pounds five shillings to make a grand ensign for the troopers which was decorated with two buttons of gold and tassels to hang at the top and two drums were purchased to give a martial tone to the music of the city rates all preparations being completed the next year's muster of the trained bands took place in the marsh before the mayor and corporation who dispensed four pounds sixteen shillings eight dimes in gratifications to the captains ensign bearer and other officers the force was strong having regard to the population for in fifteen seventy the chamberlain laid out more than sixty five pounds in purchasing eight score cassocks with laced sleeves and eight score breeches for eight score soldiers iron corslets and hand guns then just coming into vogue for twenty men were also stored in the guild hall after this reorganization the satellinia of the watch knights became less popular and in fifteen seventy two the corporation laid out a large sum for harness which probably meant firearms as shooting matches were fixed to take place in the marsh on midsummer's day st peter's day and st bartholomew's day one of the great difficulties of the early years of elizabeth's reign was the debasement of the currency perpetrated by henry the eighth and the base ministers of his successor with a view to restoration repeated cryings down of the value of current coin 
were made by proclamation. At the first of these three operations in 1559, the Chamberlain obtained only 61 shillings, 6 dimes, for 88 shillings, and on coins professing to be worth 10 pounds, 9 shillings, 6 dimes, he lost 3 pounds, 9 shillings, 10 dimes, or one-third of the face value. The worser sort of shillings, says a local chronicler, and the worser sort invariably passed as wages to the poor, were cried down to two and a half dimes, causing infinite distress. All outlandish money, which from its superior intrinsic value had come largely into circulation, was next forbidden to pass current, and the city treasurer lost some money on the French crowns and pistolets and Flemish anglets that he had on hand. The Queen finally prohibited the use of base coin, and issued pieces which, though far inferior in value to the currency of the Plantagenets, were an enormous improvement on that of her father and brother, and afforded incalculable relief to the whole community. The town wall, which at this period extended from the Froom near Thunderbolt Street to the Avon at the Welsh back, had long been of no practical value for the defence of the city, and the gate in it, called the Marsh Gate, was merely an obstacle to traffic. During a riot in 1561, arising, it is said, out of the baptism of a child, the doors of this gate were removed, and they were never restored. But some substitute being thought necessary, the council ordered the erection of a turnpike, also called a wollegig, and really a turnstile. Another wollegig was about the same time placed near the upper end of Steep Street, and doubtless stood at the top of a precipitous footpath on the site of the modern Christmas steps. Christmas Street, then, had not entirely lost its original name of Smith Street, and how the singular transformation was brought about remains a mystery. There was a third whirligig in Tower Lane under the gate still standing there. It is not surprising to find that the turnstiles required as frequent renovations as the stocks, which the corporation maintained in all parts of the city for the punishment of rogues, and were constantly in need of repair. Having mentioned this quaint instrument of correction, which each of the thousands of manors in England was bound to maintain, and which was everywhere to be seen down to about the beginning of Victoria's reign, it may be added that the corporation accounts contain numberless items for renewing or mending the ducking stool for ducking vixenish women, three of whom are recorded to have been washed in a single day. That the pillory was always getting worn out and that a new ladder for the gallows were required at short intervals, a cage for frantic disturbers of the peace, and a den styled a little ease in Newgate were amongst the other amenities of those good old days. Elizabeth's privy council were accustomed to issue a yearly proclamation forbidding all persons, save invalids, from eating butcher's meat during the season of Lent. The corporation, however, sought some further relief from the restriction, for the Chamberlain paid a yearly fee of one shilling to the Lord's Keeper's man for entering a certificate for eating of flesh in Lent, and this proceeding gave so much satisfaction that the fee was doubled and was paid for many years. But the Common Council, on one occasion, presumed rather too far in its evasion of the royal commands, in consideration of the sum of thirteen pounds to be paid by yearly instalments. A license was granted to a butcher living in one of the parishes outside the walls to sell meat to all comers throughout the forty days fast. But in 1570, when the favoured trader had paid eight pounds, six shillings, eight dimes of the money, Either the butcher's company raised a clamour against the violation of the statutes, or some informer 
had acquainted the privy council of the contempt and induced it to send down a reprimand for the common council hurriedly revoked the license and ordered the repayment of the amount received declaring that it was not lawful to sell flesh contrary to the butcher's ordinances though the royal mandate for abstinence continued to be issued for more than half a century afterwards the rapid growth of puritanism caused it to be ever less regarded and except amongst a sprinkling of high churchmen it was finally treated with contempt end of chapter four Chapter five of Sixteenth Century Bristol by John Latimer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter five. A deed of conveyance made to the corporation in July fifteen sixty one by a citizen named Nicholas Thorne for the alleged benefit of the Bristol Grammar School is worthy of some attention especially as all the statements hitherto published respecting the foundation of that institution are more or less defective and inaccurate robert thorne the grandfather of the above nicholas was a prosperous local merchant in the reign of henry the seventh and is asserted to have been one of the chief promoters of the memorable enterprise in which john cabot discovered newfoundland and the american mainland in 1497 he or his son robert served as mayor of bristol in 1514 to 1515 but he eventually removed to london where he died in 1519 there is no bequest towards founding a school in his will but from a circumstance to be noted presently he probably left some private directions to his family and executors his eldest son robert who was m p for bristol in fifteen twenty three had spent his early life in spain where he acquired great wealth and in fifteen thirty two in conjunction with his brother nicholas and his grandfather's surviving executor john goderich he determined to found a grammar school there was at that date a hospital almshouse and church dedicated of st bartholomew to which the beautiful early english gateway near the bottom of christmas steps is now the only existing relic the charity was founded by one of the barons de la ware and the living representative of that family was then the patron but the yearly value of the endowment hardly maintained the master and brethren the buildings were falling into decay and de la ware's embarrassed resources rendered him desirous of being relieved of the institution so on january the thirty first fifteen thirty two an important legal document was executed by his lordship with the assent and cooperation of the master of the hospital it recited that agreements had been entered into between them and robert thorne by which the latter had undertaken provided the hospital and its estates were conveyed in fee to himself his brother and the above executor to convert the buildings within six years into convenient house for a grammar school to provide a schoolmaster and usher and to found a yearly obit service in the hospital church at which ten priests and six clerks should pray for the welfare of de la ware and the souls of all his ancestors it had been further stipulated that the existing alms people should remain in the hospital for their lives receiving four pence each per week for food and that a priest should be maintained to pray daily for his lordship until the school was opened in consideration of which covenants de la ware and the master renounced all rights and titles to the building and its estates forever no mention is made of any punicary payment but it is certain that the peer owed money to thorn the above transaction was illegal until it had obtained the assent of the crown but a license in was granted by henry the eighth 
in the following March, with permission to convey the property to the corporation in trust for Thorne's laudable purpose. Robert Thorne died a few months afterwards, but had previously appointed the first schoolmaster, a school being temporarily held in a large room over Thorne Gate, and he bequeathed by will three hundred pounds and a debt due from de la Ware towards the making up of the new institution besides devising several hundred pounds for various charitable purposes in bristol by his death followed soon after by the demise of goderich nicholas thorne the brother mayor in fifteen forty four to fifteen forty five became seized in fee of the bartholomew state but although he survived for many years he took no steps to convey the property to the corporation in his last will however dated in august fifteen forty six a few days before his death he directed the transfer to be made by his executors at the cost of his estate and bequeathed a legacy with his books maps etc to the school his eldest son a little boy thus became legal owner of the hospital and nothing could be done by the executors on the death of the young still under age in fifteen fifty seven the property devolved upon his next brother nicholas the corporation now thought it time to intervene and in fifteen fifty eight nicholas covenanted with the two members of parliament for the city that he would on coming of age convey the property to the corporation on condition of being granted for a term of years or for life such portions of the estate as he might select accordingly in july fifteen sixty one as stated at the beginning of this chapter he granted the estate to the civic body in fee simple for the alleged purpose of carrying out his father's and uncle's intentions although some corporate money was spent on taking possession of the charity lands the whole affair was a delusive farce and the conduct of the corporation clearly due to a secret arrangement was almost incredibly scandalous nicholas thorne having influential friends at the council house where he afterwards became chamberlain the common council in the following september demised to him and to his heirs for ever the entire hospital estate the school buildings excepted reserving a grand rent of thirty pounds in consequence of this conveyance the property at his death devolved upon one of his daughters anne pikes as absolute owner and she speedily raised a large sum by granting leases for considerable periods some public-spirited citizens indignant at the malversation at length sued the lord chancellor for an inquiry with the result that the grant of the corporation was adjudged to be fraudulent much litigation followed and mrs pikes who stuck tenaciously to the property was in sixteen ten allowed to retain it on covenanting to pay forty one pounds six shillings eight dimes per annum the common council had by that time become ashamed of the misdoings of their predecessors and in sixteen seventeen the charity lands were recovered for the benefit of the grammar school by a payment of six hundred and fifty pounds to the illegitimate possessors the estate now produces about seven hundred pounds per annum in fifteen sixty five the common council learnt with consternation that an effort was being made by the inhabitants of gloucester then a creek of bristol to procure an independent custom house for that port petitions against the proposal regarded as highly injurious to local commerce were hurriedly dispatched to london the lord treasurer's aid was besought with a gratification and the rejection of the project was temporarily secured in fifteen seventy six the members of parliament for gloucester introduced a bill to carry out the desire of their constituents but it was stoutly opposed by their bristol colleagues sergeant walsh recorder and philip langley and was ultimately thrown out but in fifteen eighty to local dismay 
Queen Elizabeth, by letters patent, established a custom house at Gloucester and attached to it the upper creeks of the Severn. Earnest protests against this arrangement were addressed by the corporation to the Privy Council, who, in 1582, directed a commission to sit at Berkeley to inquire into the merits of the case. To meet the outlay incurred on this and other matters, the Common Council took the unusual course of levying a rate upon the citizens, which produced eighty pounds. A great effort was thereupon made to induce the government to change its policy, the Recorder of London and other councils being employed to set forth the ancient privileges of Bristol. In a petition to the Privy Council, the arguments of which do not hang very well together, the corporation maintained that the upper country creeks of the Severn from Berkeley to Worcester had belonged to this port for time out of mind, that the chiefest vent of the city as well as its chiefest source of grain and victuals was the course of the Severn as far as Shrewsbury, and that the shutting up of this vent and supply by granting a custom house to Gloucester threatened imminent ruin of Bristolians. Gloucester, it was contended, was a place of no merchandise or trade, and what was adventured there to see was only corn and prohibited exports, laden in small barks belonging to farmers and the like, to the defrauding of the Queen's customs. Moreover, these barks were forced to lade and discharge at Gatcombe, fifteen miles below Gloucester, and the depth of water there would not accommodate even fifty-ton ships, except at high tides. Yet Irish barks had found a direct trade to Gloucester, and all to ship away corn, and so we lost the benefit of their commodities at the uttering of our own. The trade and shipping of Bristol is already so decayed by reason of the premises that they have done away and must do away with their great shipping and have offered them to be sold to their great loss it is finally prayed that in regard to this urgent distress the port of bristol be restored to its ancient status the appeal met with no response the reference to the irish demand for corn made in this petition confirms much other evidence in the corporate books to the effect that the sister island was frequently unable to grow sufficient grain to provide food for its population. It had already been stated that the members of Parliament for Bristol were paid wages of two shillings a day each during their attendance at Westminster. The amount of their stipend had remained unaltered for over two centuries, and was originally fixed by statute. The reduced value of money having been recognised in 1567, when the travelling expenses of the Chamberlain, with his servant and two horses, had risen from two shillings seven dimes per day, the sum paid twenty years earlier to six shillings, the Common Council raised the members' stipend to three shillings four dimes per day each, and a further grant of twelve pounds was made for the hire and keep of their horses. The session had lasted ninety-eight days. In the next Parliament, in 1571, which sat for 63 days, the wages were increased to four shillings per day, and as the members had been obliged to make two journeys up and down, the allowance for horses was £18.12. shillings. No further change was made for many years. In the following century, the wages were increased to six shillings eight dimes per day, but the grant for horses was abolished, after the introduction of coach travelling. In April 1568, while the Duke of Norfolk was sojourning in Bath in company with the Earl of Worcester, Lord Berkeley and other noblemen, six hogshead of wine were brought for presentation to him by the Corporation of Bristol, and four of them were sent on to him with an invitation to visit the city, which his grace accepted. The preparations for his reception were so extensive that rumours of his ambitious desire to marry the unhappy Queen of Scots 
widely regarded as presumptive heir to the English throne, must have reached the civic body. The shooting butts in the marsh underwent extensive repairs. The exterior of the guild hall was renovated. Workmen were employed day and night in decorating it, within, with gold and colours, and a large sum was spent upon the stained glass windows of St. George's Chapel and the Tolsey. A small outlay on the latter building, paid for burnishing the beasts upon the Tolsey, is now inexplicable. Strangely enough, the expense of the Duke's reception and entertainment does not appear in the accounts, and was probably defrayed by subscription or a small rate. According to the chroniclers, his grace, during his brief stay, attended service at St. Mary Redcliffe, and proceeded then to Temple Church to watch the swaying motion of the tower whilst a peal was rung upon the bells, then a local marvel. His visits seem to have given umbrage at court, and some analysts allege that he departed abruptly for London by command of the Queen. He was executed for alleged treason in 1572. In the Middle Ages, almost every corporate town followed its own caprices in regard to the size of measures. Even to the present day, I believe, the so-called hogshead of cider at Taunton is of vastly dissimilar size from the hogshead at Gloucester, and the gill of beer at Newcastle is actually half a pint. Some reformation of Bristol measures was begun by the Common Council in 1569. In the accounts for March appears, paid for making the gallon of brass greater, which was done by John Coleman Tinker, three shillings four dimes. The Mayor's calendar states that four years later, the Mayor caused a good reformation to be made for measures of barrels and kilderkins, which were made larger and of a bigger a size than they were before, and the old vessels repelled. The corporation was much excited in 1569 by the wreck of a vessel, stated in one entry to have occurred at Porter's Head Point, while in a later and doubtless more correct statement the disaster is said to have taken place on the rocks called Plot Knees in King's Road. In either case, Lord Berkeley, as Lord of the Manor of Portbury, claimed the ship and cargo, and ordered two of his officers to sell them, which appears to have been done. The corporation, on the other hand, maintained that a derelict vessel and its contents belonged to the city by virtue of the admiralty privileges granted by royal charter. The dispute resulted in a lawsuit brought to a hearing at Somerset Azazes, held in Chard in 1572, when a verdict was given for the corporation, who recovered £16 damages and costs from one of Lord Berkeley's agents, whilst the other was consigned to a debtor's prison in default of doing likewise. The civic outlay had much exceeded the receipts. Some of the items are curious. Their leading counsel for the plaintiffs received a fee of twenty shillings, and two juniors ten shillings each. The clerk of the crown, for his favour touching expedition, had a tip of ten shillings, and a dinner to the jury after the verdict cost twelve shillings eleven dimes. The corporation at this period held an admiralty court yearly, sometimes at Clevedon but more often at Porter's Head. The court was not held in a house, but in an herbe constructed of tree branches, and a good deal of gunpowder was spent in firing salutes. The outlay did not usually exceed three pounds or four pounds, but in 1570, when the above dispute was pending, the civic body flouted Lord Berkeley by holding a court at Clevedon before the mayor some of the aldermen and many burgesses to the number of one hundred horses besides footmen and sailors when the outlay was upwards of twenty-seven pounds in fifteen seventy four when the contest was over 
the authorities contented themselves with giving a drinking to the jury at the economical outlay of thirteen shillings six dimes. When the corporation resolved on flaunting a gay ensign at the muster of the trained bands, as already related, annoyance seems to have been felt that the city arms were destitute of an heraldic crest and supporters in the fashion of London. Application was consequently made to the Herald's College, and in 1569, Clarence King of Arms, granted by his letters patent the required decorations for the modest consideration of seven pounds. All Bristolians are acquainted with the extraordinary crest which this grotesque official bestowed upon the city. Perhaps they may be glad to have this explanation of the emblem. The Chamberlain records that a new common seal was at once engraven by Giles Unit, Goldsmith, the outer sides of which displayed the two unicorns as supporters, and at the top was the crest, the signification, of which is as followeth. For as much as to the good government of a city pertaineth wisdom and justice, therefore the arms issuing out of the clouds signifieth that all good gifts come from above. The balance signifieth right judgment, the serpent signifieth wisdom. The nature of the unicorn is that unto those that be virtuous they will do homage. The wreath about the helm is gold and gules, which is the colour that was devised by the king of heralds. The lower part of the seal hath no addition save the subscription. The new seal cost four pounds. The charter granting the crest runs as follows. To all and singular as well nobles and gentlemen, as others to whom these presents shall come, Robert Cook, Esquire, Elias, Clarence Coo, Principal, Heraldu, and King of Arms of the South East and West parts of this realm of England, from the river of Trent southwards, send the humble commendicons and greeting for as much or simply from the beginning the valiant and virtuous acts of worthy persons have been commended to the world with sundry monuments and remembrances of their good deserts amongst the which the chiefest and most usual have been the bearing of signs in shields called arms which are evident demonstracons of prows diversely distributed according to the qualities and deserts of the persons meeting the same to the end that such as have done commendable service to their prince or country either in war or peace may both receive the honour in their lives and also derive the same successively to their posterity after them and whereas this city of bristol have of long time been incorporate by the name of mayor and commonly as by the most noble prince of famous memory king edward the third and lately confirmed by the queen's majestic that now is by the name and names as is foresaid by virtue of which corporation and since the first grant thereof there have been ancient arms incident unto the said mayor and commonalty that is to say giles on a mount that insolent out of a castle silver upon wave a ship gold yet notwithstanding upon diverse considerations they have required me the said clarendis king of arms to grant to their ancient arms a crest with supporters due and lawful to be borne whereupon considering their worthiness and knowledge their request to be reasonable i have by virtue of my office of clarendis king of arms confirmed given and granted unto john stone now mayor john hipsley recorder david harris william pepwell robert sayer roger james and william law alderman thomas quickland and richard young sheriffs 
Robert Halton Chamberlain and Richard Wilmot Town Clerk, and to their successors in life office, this crest and supporters hereafter following, that is to say upon the helm on a reef gold and girls insolent out of the clouds two arms in Salter Charnu, in the one hand a serpent vet in the other a pair of balanced gold supported with two unicorns sent gold maned horned clayed symbols mantled gold doubled silver as more plainly a perth depicted in the margent to have and hold the said arms crest and supporters to the said mayor and commonality and to their successors and they it to use there and show for evermore without impediment let or interruption of any person or persons in witness therefore i have subscribed my hand and sent hereto the seal of my office the four and twenty day of august in the year of our lord god a thousand five hundred three score and nine and in the eleventh year of the reign of our sovereign lady elizabeth by the grace of god queen of england france and ireland defender of the faith etc etc robert cook elias clownsu roy de arms the earl of pembroke who was appointed lord high steward of the city on the fall from power of the duke of somerset in fifteen forty nine died in fifteen seventy his lordship does not seem to have used much influence at court on behalf of the city though of course he was appealed to in emergencies and civic presents to him rarely appear in the accounts on his demise the vacant post was solicited by lord chandos lord lieutenant of gloucestershire and also by the late lord steward's son but the common council always solicitous to ingrate themselves with a prominent courtier bestowed the office on elizabeth's sweet robin the earl of leicester of dubious fame lord chandos was consoled with the gift of a butt of sack whilst the chamberlain on going up to london to present the civic patent to leicester got the help of the recorder in endeavouring to pacify my lord of pembroke the new lord steward proved to be a costly ornament in fifteen seventy one eight hogsheads of wine were sent to killingworth by way of the boat to Bewdley at a cost of thirty pounds two hogsheads of sack were brought for him in london in the following year and four hogsheads were sent to warwickshire in fifteen seventy six the corporation were in the meantime beseeching him to obtain a license from the crown to purchase the weekly wool and cattle market in st thomas's street then belonging to the parish in which he succeeded but its further suits for leave to farm the customs of the port and for the appointment of a bishop of bristol the see was then held in conjunction with that of gloucester were of no avail the chamberlain made many journeys to london in pursuit of these objects and had as usual to give repeated bribes to secretaries and underlings to get an audience with the favourite and to keep his lordship in mind of the city's desires on easter eve fifteen eighty seven leicester accompanied by his brother the earl of warwick paid a visit to bristol where elaborate preparations had been made to do them honour for five days previously a band of drummers and fifers paraded streets summoning the citizens to muster in arms to the receive them and a grand skirmish took place on their arrival amidst salutes of cannon alderman kitchen's house in small street had been prepared for their lodgings no less than five pound was given for the services of an imported cook and the total cost of their entertainment during a two-night sojourn exceeded a hundred pounds exclusive of over twenty-three pounds for the horse-meat of their retinue which must have numbered several hundreds after their departure on monday morning six horse-loads of sugar marmalade figs and raisins followed them to bath as a further compliment 
but failed to render Lord Leicester happy. His lordship's sleeping accommodation in the sister city seems to have presented a sorry contrast to the luxurious provision made in Bristol, and as an effectual remedy for the shortcoming, he coolly asked Alderman Kitchen, who had accompanied the presents, for a gift of the bed on which he had reposed. The civic audit book shows that the obsequious corporation more than responded to the request, dispatching an entirely new bed, but apparently allowing Mr. Kitchen to provide the bedding. Paid to Mrs. Bland for a feather bed with a canopy and curtains of green sail belonging unto him, the bed, four pounds. To two labourers for fetching it to Mr. Kitchen's house, four dimes, which bedding with the appurtenances was sent to Bath to my lord of Leicester to lie in, who desired to have one for his bath bed, paid to a foot post for bringing a letter from Mr. Kitchen to Mr. Mayor concerning the same one shilling. As no expense was incurred for removing the bed to Bath, it may be presumed that Leicester made certain of his prize by sending some of his servants to take charge of it. End of chapter 5「Six of Sixteenth Century Bristol by John Latimer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six. Although surrounded by extensive coal fields, Bristolians of all classes long preferred the use of wood as fuel, timber being extremely cheap owing to the vast extent of Kingswood and other neighbouring forests. The winter of 1570, however, was exceptionally rigorous, and through the difficulties of transit caused by heavy snowstorms, the dearth of wood occasioned extreme distress. The corporation consequently ordered in several hundred horse loads of stone coal to the intent to bring down prices, and though there was some loss on the transaction, great relief was afforded to the poor. Charcoal was the only fuel purchased for the council house for upwards of a century afterwards. The common council in 1571 were called upon to consider the case of an impoverished member of the body, and adopted a singular expedient for his relief. The following item occurs in the Chamberlain's receipts. Received of John Lacey, Mercia, in part payment of ten pounds fine for that he should continue a burgess being dismissed of the common council until he may be hereafter called to the common council again when he shall be of better ability five pounds as the remainder of the fine was never paid it may be inferred that mr lacey did not recover his position the first record of a violently contested election of members of Parliament for the city occurs in the spring of 1571. The question involved in the struggle was one of deep interest to the trading classes generally. In the last previous Parliament in 1566, the Society of Merchant Venturers has succeeded in obtaining an act forbidding any citizen, except in members of the Society, or persons who had served an apprenticeship of seven years to a merchant, from trafficking in merchandise beyond the seas, upon pain or forfeiture of all the goods so imported or exported. The monopoly thus established excited great discontent amongst a numerous body of tradesmen, who had been accustomed to make small foreign adventures as well as amongst the workmen employed by them, and, what was still more significant, the common council, which for centuries had been dominated by the mercantile interest, revolted against it and supported the agitation of the burgesses. No details in reference to the election have been preserved except that the contest was violent and protracted. But the return of the recorder as one of the members clearly marked the defeat of the Merchants' Society. D. 
the corporation followed up this success by appealing to lord berkeley for a repeal of the act declared to be injurious to the trade of the city and a bill to that effect was read a first time at the fifth sitting of the house of commons passed through all its stages in both houses in despite of a vigorous resistance and received the royal assent in consequence of the struggle the common council appears to have been the scene of frequent virulent disputes during the year ending michaelmas fifteen seventy two the following receipts occur in the audit book received of mr snyde for calling mr john joe's knave in his ear thirteen shillings four dimes received of mr langley m p for saying to mr saxey you believe me twenty shillings received of mr robert taylor merchant for abusing mr thomas colston with contemptuous words six shillings eight dimes received of mr robert cable for abusing mr richard cole six shillings eight dimes strange to say no ancient copy of the act restoring freedom of trade to bristolians is to be found in the city and not even the slightest allusion to the statute is made in any of the local chronicles or in the histories of barrett sire evans price and nichols only the title of the measure a bill for bristow is given in the statutes at large but it is of course duly registered in the chancery rolls during the stuart dynasty merchants societies made many efforts to procure its repeal, and the corporation again submissive to mercantile influences were generally zealous in supporting the would-be monopolists but the costly exertions proved virtueless and were finally abandoned in despair all of the markets in the city were at this time held in one or other of the principal streets but the inconvenience of dealing in flour and meal in the open air during wet weather induced the common council in fifteen seventy two to order the construction of a special building for the sale of those articles the site chosen was a piece of vacant ground entered through a freestone gateway in wine street towards the expense of the building which cost about two hundred and fifty pounds the vestry of christ church made a donation of ten pounds and a further sum of over thirty pounds was extracted from two soap makers the bristol merchants had at this period acquired a large trade in the mediterranean and olive oil being largely imported by them they had induced the corporation to pass an ordinance prohibiting the manufacture of soap made of tallow or fish oil owing to the costliness of the foreign material the ordinance was frequently evaded but mr william yate a soap maker whose dwelling closely adjoined the new meal market having been detected in boiling tallow was now fined thirteen pounds six shillings eight dimes for his infraction of the edict whilst another manufacturer is alleged to have given twenty pounds of his good will an assertion of doubtful credibility seeing that he was fined ten pounds in the following year for boiling trenny oil the meal market was for many years set apart during the annual great fair for the accommodation of the numerous goldsmiths from london and elsewhere who attended to exhibit their wares in the troubled times of the following century it seems to have been converted into a guard-house for soldiery the fine freestone gateway referred to above still remained and was well known to every citizen until its removal in eighteen eighty one the crown of the arch bore the letter w and the device of the gate from which the surname yate was derived one walker the miller of brandon hill turns up in the civic accounts for fifteen seventy three having paid a trifle fine for breaking into the city pound and rescuing his horse 
contrary to law the wooden windmill which stood on the summit of the hill was then a new structure having been erected by william reed town clerk who had obtained a sixty years lease of brandon hill from the corporation in fifteen sixty four at a rent of one pounds six shillings eight dimes only a few years later in fifteen eighty one both the civic body and its lessee were thrown into consternation by the property being claimed on behalf of the crown a discovery had in fact been made that a small plot of ground on the top of the hill had been given by robert earl of gloucester to tewkesbury abbey when he founded st james's priory but had escaped appropriation on the suppression of the monasteries doubtless from its yielding no rent the men who wormed out these facts thereupon petitioned queen elizabeth for a grant of the ground as concealed crown land and this having been conceded to them at a fee farm rent of five shillings they demanded the estate from the corporation who were forced to buy their interest for the sum of thirty pounds as there is a common tradition that the queen granted brandon hill to the city as a place to dry clothes it may be added that the hill with the exception of the above plot had belonged to the corporation from time immemorable and that the right of free passage over it by the public and of user by washerwomen was formally recognised in a corporate document of fifteen thirty three before elizabeth was born the year fifteen seventy four was long memorable amongst bristolians for the magnificent entertainment of queen elizabeth during her progress through the western countries a visit had been anticipated in the summer of fifteen seventy but after the corporation in a panic at its neglect of the roads near newgate had laid out a large sum on repairs the queen altered her route the assurance of her arrival four years later induced the common council to make unprecedented exertions to gratify their pomp-loving sovereign it was in the first place resolved to raise funds by a general collection from the inhabitants which was doubtless effected by a rateable assessment the amount thus secured was five hundred and thirty five pounds one shilling seven dimes obtained as follows all saints ward a hundred and seventy three pounds ten shillings trinity ward a hundred and four pounds seven shillings mary lee port ward ninety one pounds four shillings seven dimes st ewan's ward ninety four pounds seventeen shillings eight dimes redcliffe ward seventy one pounds two shillings four dimes a further sum of four hundred and fifty pounds was borrowed from charity funds to be repaid as speedily as convenient and the dean and chapter contributed five pounds thus supplied the authorities proceeded to paint and gild the high cross lawford's gate newgate and Foomgate to order fifty-three lighter loads of sand for the purpose of levelling the streets to purchase nearly two tons of gunpowder to collect one hundred and thirty pieces of cannon to enrol four hundred infantry clothed in the city uniform and to make various other provisions for her majesty's entertainment the queen arrived on august the fourteenth after making a preliminary halt at st lawrence's hospital for the purpose of changing her travelling dress for more gorgeous apparel her majesty advanced to Norfolk's gate where she was received by the mayor and common council whose mouthpiece the recorder addressed her in the extravagantly flattering terms in which she delighted and presented her with a splendid purse containing one hundred pounds in gold the gay procession then started and after a brief stop at the high cross where some pleasant sights were showed and another at the grammar school in christmas street where the boys poetical orations were so lengthy that they were brusquely cut short the royal visitor reached the great house on st augustine's back 
the newly furnished mansion of mr john young which had been prepared for her reception her arrival being saluted by deafening peals of cannon and musketry the queen remained in the city a week and those desirous of details respecting the amusements offered her consisting mainly of sham fighting on a land where water and tedious rhymes twaddled by a man named churchyard may be referred to nicholas's progress and other works her majesty rewarded her host with the honour of knighthood the corporate outlay during the visit was one thousand and fifty three pounds fourteen shillings eleven dimes of which amounted thirty seven pounds were demanded by royal officers including the yeomen of the bottles for their fees the visit of queen elizabeth to bristol subsequently involved the corporation in an expenditure that appears to have been much begrudged it is probable that when the recorder who lived at wellington near taunton travelled hither to take part in the queen's reception advantage was taken of the opportunity to hold the annual gaol delivery at all events when elizabeth arrived nine prisoners condemned to death were lying in newgate and on the queen becoming acquainted with the fact she intimated her intention of pardoning them as a special act of grace the royal word however did not satisfy the requirements of the law which could be met only by a formal instrument under the great seal and the lord chancellor and his subordinates forthwith came down upon the corporation for the customary fees amounting to over fourteen pounds the disgusted civic body had no alternative but to pay their money but partially recouped itself by appealing for the assistance of the parish churches by which eight pounds thirteen shillings four dimes were brought in while the bishop of gloucester who held the see of bristol in commandam forwarded a personal donation of two pounds thirteen shillings four dimes thus reducing the civic outlay to a trifling sum the year fifteen seventy five was marked by a terrible visitation of plague which broke out immediately after the great fair in july and continued its ravages for six months contemporary analysts assert that the victims numbered upwards of one thousand nine hundred but the figures are probably much exaggerated four ex-mayors three of whom were aldermen were however carried off the virulence of epidemics in bristol as in other old towns was doubtless largely attributable to the unhealthy supply of water chiefly drawn from wells in close proximity to the parochial burial grounds most of which were in crowded localities limited in area and reeking with putidity the quay pipe was supplied from an abundant spring the so-called boiling well at ashley but a large portion of the long conduit was unprotected and the chamberlain was insistently called upon to remove the obstructions in covered pipe caused by the bodies of dead cats thus in december fifteen seventy four he enters paid for taking three cats out of the key pipe where one was two yards long five days five shillings six dimes the pestilence caused on this occasion a general prostration of local trade and the depression was seriously aggravated by unprecedented disasters at sea in november fifteen seventy six the chamberlain was dispatched to london with a supplication to the queen representing the decay of the city and the lamentable condition of its merchants through the recent loss of eleven ships and five barks no inconsiderable proportion of the entire shipping of the port which according to an official report drawn up by the customs officers numbered only forty four vessels in fifteen seventy two the petition was presented by lord leicester but the applicants met with no warmer consolation than that the queen was very sorry the commerce of bristol did not recover from these disasters for upward of thirty years 
an audacious act of piracy was committed in the avon in july fifteen seventy seven by a gang of sailors and ruffians who took forcible possession of a small dungarvan vessel lying at peel robbed several other ships laden with goods for the fair and eventually sailed off with their booty how an alarm was raised does not appear but the record states that the pirates were pursued by lord leicester's flibboat whatever that may have been with a crew of sixty armed men and that the villains dreading capture landed at start point when all but four managed to escape those apprehended were tried at the gull delivery in september when three were sentenced to death and one says the chamberlain was saved by his book an expression perfectly intelligible to every reader eight years ago but now requiring explanation in the middle ages the ordinary criminal courts could not pass sentence on a felon traitors excepted who claimed to be in holy orders and who was amenable only to an ecclesiastical tribunal and as practically everyone except the priest was then illiterate it became an established point in legal practice that a prisoner was to be deemed a cleric if he were able to read a certain verse vulgarly known as the neck verse in the book of psalms the unreasoning conversatism of the legal profession has perhaps no better illustrated than the fact that the above privilege commonly known as benefit of clergy was not abolished till eighteen twenty seven although long before that date nearly every description of felony had been exempted from the relief by successive acts of parliament and a thief might be hanged for stealing twelve pence farthing it may be added that criminals known to be laymen were entitled to the benefit only once and that to secure their conviction for a second offence they were seared on the thumb for the first with a red-hot iron only a few weeks before the trial of the above pirates there is the following item in the civic accounts paint a smith for making iron cuffs set in the guild hall behind the prisoner's bar for the burning of persons in the hand two shillings six dimes to return to the three convicts the corporation believing that seafaring malefactors needed an impressive warning resolved on hanging and gibbeting the criminals on cannon's marsh at the junction of the avon and Thune, and in view of every passing vessel the bodies being suspended so low that they were immersed at every high tide the carpenter's wages for making the gibbet were still only one shilling per day and those of two apprentices one shillings two dimes a civic payment made to a travelling dramatic company in october fifteen seventy seven is of some interest to students of elizabethan literature inasmuch as it mentions the name of the play then performed the record also indicates for the first time that the entertainment took place in the evening paid my lord of leicester's players and for links to give light in the evening the play was called mango one pounds two shillings the audit book of the following year shows that six bands of comedians visited the city lord berkeley's players are stated to have performed what mischief worketh in the mind of man mr c howard's the illegible ethiopian the earl of suffolk's the court of comfort and the earl of bath's quid pro quo the players of the earl of derby and the lord chamberlain afterwards appeared on successive nights in one week but the chamberlain then and afterwards failed to note the pieces performed some excitement was caused in october fifteen seventy seven by the arrival in the port of two vessels under the command of the famous martin frobisher the ships according to the chroniclers had come direct from Cate or cataya after a fruitless endeavour to discover a passage to india and china by the way of the arctic seas 
they brought home however a large quantity of ore esteemed to be very rich and full of gold and on information being sent to the government the privy council directed that the treasure should be lodged for safety in the castle until some specimens had been analysed the stone eventually proved worthless frobisher also brought three savages doubtless esquimo clothed in deer skins but all of them died within a month of their arrival the virgin queen enters upon the twentieth year of her reign on november the seventeenth fifteen seventy seven and the event was celebrated in bristol in a manner that manifested the loyalty and affection of the citizens the members of the corporation robed in scarlet repaired to the cathedral to hear the sermon a mode of attending service that became more and more in favour with the growth of puritanism and on returning from church five trumpeters from the cataya ships were engaged to head the civic procession and fill the air with martial music in the evening a great bonfire blazed before the high cross the demonstration was thenceforth repeated annually and was continued for many years after the queen's death the keys of the city being at this period in urgent need of repair a strange expedient for their cheap renovation was devised by the common council the first mention of the matter occurs in the audit book november fifteen seventy seven as follows paid the church wardens of st stephen's for one tombstone for the key wall four shillings immediately afterwards four large tombstones and five sledge loads of smaller stones headstones were extracted from st lawrence's church adjoining st john's and another large block was taken from a church not specified soon afterwards a ponderous stone requiring two brace of horses to drag it was removed from st lawrence's church and many similar abstractions are noted subsequently the ruined friaries were further drawn upon and a massive monument out of the demolished carmelite church was contributed by sir john young of the great house no reference to these desecrations is made by the analyst nor do they mention the closing of st lawrence's church of which the corporation were the patrons the deed annexing the parish to that of st john dated in march fifteen eighty asserts that the income of the former was only four pounds ten shillings which was insufficient to maintain a minister the church was converted into a warehouse its burial ground in christmas street is believed to be now covered by the premises recently built by messrs j s fry and sons end of chapter six Chapter seven of sixteenth century Bristol by John Latimer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter seven. The story of the curious square Bristol farthings issued in the reign of Queen Elizabeth has scarcely been alluded to by the historians of the city, being apparently regarded as unworthy the dignity of their works those grave writers little imagined that the tokens they contemptuously ignored would be so highly prized in our time that some of the aforesaid histories have become of less value in the market than the despised farthings a variation from original prices that is likely to widen rather than diminish under the altered circumstances local readers will perhaps be glad to have further information on the subject from authentic sources down to the period at which this narrative has arrived and indeed to a much later date the english government issued no coins inferior in value to the silver penny a somewhat remarkable fact when it is remembered that the purchasable power of the elizabethan penny was fully equal to that of the fourpence of modern days to supply an obvious want about the year 1574, certain tradesmen in various towns began to issue farthing tokens of lead, tin, mixed metal, and even of leather, 
and trouble speedily arose out of the valueless character of the pieces which often could not be traced to the persons that profited largely by circulating them that the grievance spread to the city is proved by a minute of the privy council dated november the seventeenth fifteen seventy seven ordering a letter to be sent to the recorder of bristol mr hannam then practising in the courts at westminster informing him that certain small coins of copper of which samples were enclosed had been lately stamped in the city and not only uttered and received from man to man for farthings but also current for that value almost throughout the country thereabout the recorder was further directed to make diligent inquiry on the spot by whom the coins had been issued and by what means they had become so widely prevalent and to certify the result without respect of persons oddly enough there is no further mention of the subject in the privy council minutes but the lacking information is supplied in the corporate records which preserve a letter from the privy council to the mayor dated three weeks later december the eighth showing that the recorder had not only fulfilled his mission with great electricity but had already forwarded its results to the government the recorder had reported that the tokens in circulation were of numerous varieties and were uttered by inholders bakers brewers and other victuallers who refused to receive them again because divers had been counterfeited for remedy whereof and for the benefit of the poor the learned council of the city had advised the use of a general stamp meaning doubtless a stamp belonging exclusively to the corporation through whom he transmitted his report the letter to the mayor then proceeds the privy council very well allow this and commend the providence of the citizens and notify its continent that the use of these farthings shall continue provided that the quantity do not exceed the value of thirty pounds and that they may be made current only within the city a warrant sanctioning the above privileges was brought down by two corporate delegates whose travelling expenses were largely swollen by the extortions of government officials the corporation rewarded the recorder for his pains with a large sugar loaf costing eighteen dimes per one pound and a gallon of wine and no time was lost in stamping tokens for on january the fourteenth fifteen seventy four the chamberlain records received of mr mayor in copper tokens the sum of fifteen pounds to be delivered to the commons of this city and to be current for farthing tokens according to the warrant procured by mr smythes and mr john cole fifteen pounds it is probable that these pieces were struck in london and the cost included in the delegates expenses two further parcels raising the issue to the sum of thirty pound fixed by the warrant were received in july and september and the stamps were delivered to mr mayor again these pieces were struck by edward event a local goldsmith who was paid five pounds for the copper and stamping leaving the corporation a clear profit of ten pounds no issue took place in fifteen seventy nine but in april fifteen eighty evernet struck fifteen pounds worth by command of the mayor the recorder and the alderman for that there was a great want of them in the town and the quantity was doubled in september notwithstanding this copious issue the demand seems to have exceeded the supply for in the audit book of fifteen eighty one are the following entries received of e evernet in copper tokens stamped by warrant of the mayor alderman and recorder in pursuance of the warrant of the privy council which doth extend to the stamping of thirty pound worth at a time thirty pounds paid event for stamping ten pounds the audit book for fifteen eighty two is lost 
but it is not improbable that the civic body took further advantage of its profitable privilege we have proof that in fifteen eighty three Evernet received fresh orders and coined 28,800 tokens using, on this occasion, a new mould, costing six shillings eight dimes. In 1584, the Chamberlain journeyed to London for, amongst other matter, obtaining a renewal of the coinage warrant. But no further issues took place for some years seeing indeed that in the previous six years the numbers of tokens known to have been coined was nearly a hundred and twenty thousand and may have been over a hundred and forty thousand there could have been no real lack of small change but when the legal pieces ceased to appear knaves hastened to supply their place in march fifteen eighty seven a butcher named christopher Gallery having been convicted of counterfeiting the copper tokens of this city to the great hurt and hindrance of the commons paid a fine of five pounds but many other swindlers must have been at work for in the following month apparently at the command of the government the corporation brought up no less than twelve thousand six hundred false tokens the treasurer's record is paid by the mayor and aldermen's commandment with the consent of the whole common council according to a proclamation to diverse persons as well of the city as of the country for diverse sorts of copper tokens received of them because they were counterfeited by diverse evil disposed persons and therefore they were not allowed in this city thirteen pounds two shillings eleven dimes no further mention of tokens occurred until 1594, when the Privy Council informed the Mayor by letter that it had come to their knowledge that many Bristol tradesmen had illegally stamped farthing tokens in brass and lead, and after uttering had refused to accept them again, whereby grievous inconvenience was caused to the poor. The magistrates were ordered to suppress such proceedings and to compel the fraudulent utterers to change the tokens for current money. The corporation thereupon obtained a fresh warrant from the government authorizing the issue of forty pounds worth of farthings and paid seven pounds for the warrant and three shillings for dimes for a new stamp. The cost of stamping, including the copper, was now reduced to four shillings in the pound and so the chamberlain was allowed another shilling in the pound for his trouble in paying them away to traders and workmen the tokens yielded a profit of fifteen shillings in the pound whether this lucrative business was or was not continued in fifteen ninety five is unknown owing to the disappearance of the accounts but it was resumed in fifteen ninety seven when thomas wall a bristol goldsmith was ordered to stamp to the value of thirteen pounds ten shillings the cost amounting to one-fourth of the value as before those two issues produced an aggregate of fifty one thousand three hundred and sixty farthings to be added to the figures already given in fifteen ninety eight the authorities ordered the preparation of an improved mould but this was never used in fact the civic rulers in their pursuit of gain had overshot the demand and temporarily lost almost as much as had been brought in and in the autumn of fifteen ninety eight the chamberlain records paid out for to take in brass tokens to thomas wall in money thirty three pounds sixteen shillings six dimes the loss was however partially redeemed in subsequent years by cautious reissues the whole of the authorised elizabethan tokens was square in shape and bore the letters c b on one side and the arms of the city very rudely cut on the other although only three moulds are mentioned in the accounts they seem to have been more numerous for mr h b bowles who has given much attention to the subject and possesses a unique collection of english tokens has noted eight varieties some of which have the city arms reserved that is 
with the ship sailing to the right, but these may have been forgeries. Few things indeed were easier to rogues than to counterfeit work so clumsy, and the temptation to do so was great when a shilling's worth of copper produced twenty shillings worth of tokens. On the occasion of James I, the corporation petitioned for a renewal of the lapsed privilege, but the prayer met with no response, and as nothing was done by the government, privately issued tokens, many of the basest character naturally reappeared. In 1609, the celebrated Sir Robert Cotton, in urging the government to issue a national copper coinage, asserted that not less than 6,000 traders in various parts of England were then every year cast in lead tokens, practically valueless, yet of a pretended aggregate value of about £30,000, whereof nine-tenths disappeared yearly to the profit of the utterers. His recommendation was not adopted, but in 1613 Lord Harrington was granted for three years the sole right of coining farthings, to avoid the great abuse of leaden tokens made by the city of Bristol and others, and private coining was thenceforth forbidden. No local tokens struck in lead appeared to have been preserved. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of Sixteenth Century Bristol by John Latimer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight: A shipping disaster which appears to have long obstructed the navigation of the Avon occurred at Hungroad in March, fifteen seventy nine, when a large vessel called the Lion, laded with Spanish salt and oil, struck the rocks and immediately foundered in the river. The corporation called on a number of ship captains to superintend the raising of the ship, but the measures they took were unavailing, and the civic body, in great alarm, sought the advice of the Privy Council, apparently without result. At length, in May, the hulk was weighed and brought to shore, but it soon afterwards slipped back into the river, and the situation became even worse than before. In spite of heavy expenditure, the tidal way was blocked for upwards of a year, and was cleared in April 1580 only by tearing the wreck into pieces. During the Irish rebellions of this period, the city suffered severely from the frequent presence of large bodies of soldiers sent down from London for embarkmentation, but often detained for weeks by contrary winds. The troops impressed from the lowest classes spent their time in debauchery and rioting, setting the civic authorities, who were required to feed them, at defiance. In August 1579, when 600 ruffians were lying here, the Chamberlain paid 8 shillings 9 dimes for making and setting up a gibbet in High Street to terrify the rage of the soldiers who were so unruly both in fighting and killing. This grim menace proved so effectual that it was repeated on two subsequent occasions. In December of the same year, another body of 1,000 troops arrived, but was speedily got rid of. But a fresh batch of 500 came down in July 1580, and was unable to sail for six weeks, during which disorders were of frequent occurrence. The insolence of the bravos, often bringing them into collisions with pungacious distillions in which they were sometimes soundly punished. The unruly soldiers were not the only trouble of the corporation. The government, in forwarding the men, required the city to provide them not only with rations and pay, but sometimes with conduct money when they departed, and shipping had also to be hired for their transport. In the first of the above cases, the outlay was £483, in the second, £443, and in the third, £1,160, and those large sums cannot have been raised without extreme difficulty. The embarrassment was still greater in the year ending Michaelmas 1581, 
when owing to king philip of spain sending some forces to assist the irish rebels the government dispatched great reinforcements by way of bristol and the corporate expenditure on them was about four thousand pounds in order to recover the money laid out on each continent the chamberlain had to ride up to court and as it was never an easy matter to wring money from the promiscuous queen the unfortunate gentleman had much to endure in following her about to country residences and gratifying the officials for their help in getting his accounts passed the following illustrates his vexations september fifteen eighty paid one of my lord treasurer's secretaries for his pains in examining my account for it was very much misliked of and evil taken by my lord treasurer because the charge was so great being one thousand one hundred and sixty pounds eight shillings and eight and three quarters dime so that two days were spent in trying of the said account which thanks to god could not be faulted in one half penny ten shillings how the poor chamberlain who had only a single attendant managed to convey large sums of money safely from london to bristol on one occasion he brought down two thousand five hundred pounds is a mystery but though he was frequently on the road and each journey to and from london occupied three or four days he never encountered a mishap the rebellion partially collapsed in fifteen eighty three when the mayor and his brethren were regaled at the tolsey with a sight of the head of the revolted earl of desmond pickled in a pipkin and on its way to gratify the court it is stated in a previous chapter that the task of paving the streets was at this period laid upon the proprietors of frontages who were severely required to repair one half of the street as far as the gutter that ran down the centre as each owner fulfilled his duty at his own time and in his own fashion the general result must have left much to be desired and in september fifteen seventy nine the corporation initiated a reform the audit book records paid the new picture of the streets as a reward on his making the abode there until he pitches all the streets in the way agreed upon by mr mayor and the alderman and will not take above one and a half dimes per yard and do his work well twenty shillings further items in subsequent years show that the new official was vigorously at work difficulties however arose in localities where there were houses only on one side of the thoroughfare such was the case at redcliffe hill and in may fifteen eighty three the chamberlain paid sixpence to a drummer to get company together to carry stones to mend the highway at that spot the summons was effectual for four months later the civic treasurer dispersed four dimes for ale drank by the mayor and his brethren at redcliffe church style doubtless after an inspection of the repairs the difficulty of communicating with persons at a distance before the establishment of a post office is illustrated by the following item fifteen eighty august paid to savage the foot post to go to wellington with a letter to the recorder touching the holding of the sessions and if not there to go to wimborne minster where he has a house where he found him and returned with a letter which post was six days upon that journey in very foul weather and i paid him for his pains thirteen shillings four dimes about the close of fifteen eighty the corporation resolved upon petitioning the queen for a new charter empowering them to increase the aldermanic body from six to twelve the matter was placed in the hands of the recorder who was furnished with funds to gratify the courtiers whose help was desirable but one of his disbursements proved disappointing one dr wilson it appears received ten pounds upon his undertaking to obtain the queen's signature approving of the scheme but the money was no sooner pocketed than the doctor departed from court and is heard of no more 
Secretary Walshingham proved a more trustworthy friend, but other influential persons wanted gratifications, and the affair still hung fire. Nearly six months after the Wilson collapse, when the Attorney General was on a visit to Ashton Court, the corporation sent him a seven-pint bottle of hullock, wine, and half a pound of sugar, desiring to understand his pleasure, respecting the delayed patent, and remarking that the Washington's secretary had twice sent information that the Queen had signed the warrant. Mr. Attorney, moved perhaps by the present, but more by the hope of favours to come, promised that the great seal should be appended with all speed, and this was actually accomplished in July 1581, after the civic body had incurred some further expenses in getting Bristol styled a city instead of a town. The recorder on his arrival with the charter, for which he had laid out £53, was welcomed with a present of two gallons of wine, muscadel of Candia, and another gallon was sent to the Attorney General, with the promise of a more substantial reward. Four hogsheads of wine, costing sixteen pounds, were next forwarded to Secretary Walshingham in gratitude for his services. Ten pounds were given to the Secretary's secretary for keeping his master in mind of the subject, and five pounds were paid to the Attorney General's clerk for his travail. The Chamberlain noted that Mr. Attorney and the Recorder were still to be suitably recompensed, but the following year's audit book is still missing. To meet the above expenditure, the ancient ordinances dealing rigorously with foreigners, that is, non-freemen, trading in the city, were brought into operation, the obnoxious class being offered the alternative of paying fines for admission as burgesses or of having their place of business shut down. Three dyers were mulcted in ten pounds each, and two musicians, whose mode of gaining a livelihood is shrouded in darkness, paid fifty-three shillings four dimes each. Numerous others were dealt with, and the total receipts from the process were sixty-seven pounds eleven shillings. In January, 1581, at the opening of the third session of Elizabeth's fourth Parliament, originally convoked nine years previously, John Popham, the senior member for Bristol, was appointed to fill the vacant office of Speaker. The proceedings were of a peculiar character. When Popham's election was suggested, the Commons were informed that he had been withdrawn from his parliamentary duties by the Upper House which claimed his presence there as Solicitor General. Applications for his release from this service having been made to the Lords, he was permitted to return to his proper place. The Corporation of Bristol, much gratified by the honour bestowed on the city representative, presented him with a hogshead of claret. Popham, who had resigned the office of recorder a few years before, afterwards became the Lord Chief Justice, whose acquisition of Littlecote, the home of Will Dayroll, was long regarded with deep suspicion by the people of Wiltshire. End of chapter 8a perambulation of the city boundaries took place in September 1584. A breakfast for the mayor and sheriffs, consisting of seven quarts of wine and two pennyworth of cakes, was the first feature of the proceedings. After the shire stones had been all duly visited, an afternoon drinking disposed of a gallon of Maratha mentioned for the first time and costing four pence per pint. The only other charge was one shillings four dimes, paid to labourers to make the ways open. The audit book for 1585 had not been preserved, and we are consequently deprived of precise information respecting the distress caused by the remarkable dearth of that year, during which wheat rose to the famine price of a hundred and ten shillings per quarter. 
the corporation adopted vigorous measures for the relief of the poor importing four thousand bushels of rye from danzig and more than one thousand bushels of english grain all of which was retailed at about cost price country bakers were also encouraged to bring in supplies of bread and although there appears to have been some rioting order was generally maintained an attempt to ship off a quantity of butter consigned to france was promptly defeated by the mayor who proceeded with a body of officers to hung road boarded the vessel and brought away the cargo which was sold in the market at two and a half dimes per pound whilst the sailors who had attempted to resist the seizure were fined for the offence and lodged in prison until they paid the money the dearth continued in fifteen eighty six but the government rejected the corporation's appeal for permission to import foreign grain the strained relations of the government with king philip of spain and the unquestionable design of that monarch to attempt the conquest of england led to an outburst of military enthusiasm throughout the country in the closing months of fifteen eighty five in november the common council ordered a new ancient or banner for the trained bands which were mustered in college green and in the following month all the able-bodied inhabitants were summoned by drums and fifes which the chamberlain sometimes called pipes and sometimes fifties to attend a general muster at adercliffe now redcliffe parade to choose their corporals these gatherings were preliminary a grand inspection in march fifteen eighty six by the earl of pembroke who had been appointed lord lieutenant of bristol and somerset the earl who arrived with a guard of thirty-two horsemen was received with many demonstrations of respect a large body of citizens in arms were waiting and thirty-two cannon fired a salute whilst he was welcomed by the authorities the mansion of alderman kitchen in small street had been prepared for his reception and every available delicacy was provided for his entertainment a pavilion was also erected in the marsh for his use during the inspection finally before his departure on the following day he was feasted at a magnificent breakfast and an immense present of sugar and sweetmeats including two costly boxes of marmalade one decorated with the arms of the queen and the other with his own was offered for his acceptance his visit cost the corporation nearly one hundred pounds but in despite of the hospitality and tokens of respect the earl's pique at being refused the office of lord high steward appears to have been still allayed and his arrogance in ignoring the mayor's right of precedence in the city by taking the upper hand of his chief host gave so much offence that it was represented to the queen who according to a local analyst rebuked him for his presumption and committed him to the tower until he paid a fine for the offence the trained bands were mustered again in july when a picture of a man was set up in the marsh for gun practice and a third muster took place in september the corporation did not bear any grudge against lord pembroke for his discourtesy as in the following year when there were pirates in the seven they equipped an armed pinnace to convey a barge laden with his goods from bristol to his residence at cardiff but about the same time on an appeal from the civic body the government appointed the mayor deputy lieutenant for the city thus avoiding future collisions john carr a bristolian whose name is ever held to be in honour as the founder of queen elizabeth's hospital died in june fifteen ninety six aged about fifty two years Mr. Carr was the elder son of Alderman William Carr, a prosperous merchant and member of Parliament for the city from 1559 to 1567, who was himself a local benefactor. The Alderman purchased in 1562 for £3,500 
the reversion in fee of the manor of Congresbury and Wick St. Lawrence, comprising about 5,000 acres of land, subject to the life interest of a lady who survived him. But £2,000 of the consideration remained unpaid at his death, when the net yearly value of the estate was estimated by an audacious jury at only £54, although somewhat less than half the manor now belongs to the hospital, the annual receipts exceed £4,500. John Carr, on coming into possession, paid off the remainder of the purchase money. He was already an extensive soap maker, having works not only in Bristol, but at Bow, near London, and made a discovery in his business, which brought him large returns. He refers to this subject in his will, executed in April 1586, as follows. Whereas I have committed in trust to my servant, John Dinay, the trade of white soap making, a thing by me found out and put in use here in England, and goes on to specify the manner in which the secret was to be confided, first to his widow, who was to have the profits for ten years, and afterwards to his relative, Simon Aldworth. Carr, though living in Baldwin Street, probably spent much of his time at his factory near London, for he had evidently paid much attention to Christ's Hospital, then a new institution, and resolved on founding a school of a similar character. His will accordingly directed that, after the payment of a number of legacies and the liquidation of certain mortgages and other debts, which he anticipated would occupy five years, his executors should transfer his estate in Somerset and most of his house property in Bristol to the corporation in trust to found a hospital or place for bringing up poor children and orphans, being men children, born of indignant or decayed parents in Bristol or on his estates. The system of governing which was to be modelled upon that in operation at Christ's Hospital the testator trusted that the corporation would erect a suitable building for this hospital of which he made them patrons guiders and governors forever the validity of mr carr's will was disputed by his younger brother the owner of the woodspring priory estate but he withdrew his opposition on payment of one thousand pounds and on being released of a debt of six hundred and sixty six pounds due to his brother's estate. The corporation displayed a great earnestness in carrying out Mr. Carr's intentions, and hurried forward the period he had fixed for establishing the school by the payment of legacies, etc., having effected their purpose within four years of his death. They obtained a charter from Queen Elizabeth, which, after reciting that they had bestowed some thousands of pounds for more quickly hastening carr's pious object constituted the mayor and common council a distinct incorporation for the perpetual government of the charity and relieved them from the restrictions of the statutes of mortmain under which carr's bequest was invalid the applicants had doubtless flattered the queen by beseeching her to become the patron of the intended institution for the charter further directs that it shall be for ever styled the hospital of queen elizabeth the corporation next resolved on granting to the school in perpetuity the mansion of the suppressed monastery of the gaunts and the adjoining orchard the school was opened in the summer of fifteen ninety when twelve boys were admitted in fifteen ninety seven in consequence of a bequest by one anthony standbank of several houses in the city in trust for the hospital the corporation obtained an act of parliament confirming the queen's charter and legalizing the acceptance of standbank's estate the subsequent history of the corporate dealings with the school have been published in the annuals of bristol in the seventeenth eighteenth and nineteenth centuries the christmas week of fifteen eighty six is marked by two sadly significant entries 
in the Chamberlain's accounts. The first reads, Paid a perseverant for bringing down the proclamation concerning the treason done by the Queen of Scots, which proclamation was proclaimed on St. Stephen's Day, 13 shillings four dimes. As no one in those days escaped death when charged with treason by the government, the next item is still more significant. Paid for wood for and making a bonfire at the High Cross, when the proclamation was made, three shillings four dimes. The unfortunate Queen was executed on February the 8th, after being much tormented by adjurators to forswear her faith on the part of Richard Fletcher, the servile and stony-hearted Dean of Peterborough. This man was appointed Bishop of Bristol in 1590 for his services in this tragedy and on condition of his granting the estates of the C2 courtiers, which he did so extensively, that he left little to his successors. He is said to have died from immoderated indulgence in tobacco. The minutes of the Privy Council acquaint us with an incident which must have occasioned an extraordinary sensation in Bristol, yet which the local chroniclers, whilst carefully noting many trivialities, chose to utterly ignore. It appears that in the spring of 1586, when the office of mayor was held by Richard Cole, a wealthy and widely esteemed merchant, allied by marriage with two notable city families, the Smythes and the Carrs, the lord of the manor of Thornbury, Lord Stafford, claimed a right to seize the person and property of the chief magistrate and of his brother Thomas, also a merchant, alleging that they were both villains appurtenant to his manor and that he was as free to deal with them as with his cattle. His lordship, having threatened to use personal violence for attaining his ends, the brothers appealed for protection to the government, and on June the 19th, the Privy Council addressed a letter to Stafford, offering him to forbear from arresting or molesting them, and from disturbing them in their trade, seeing that they were prepared to answer his claim in the law courts. It was added that the principal officer of such a place, and his brother, having been both themselves and their ancestors, always reputed freemen, should not be so hardly dealt with upon any supposition and Lord Stafford was commanded to proceed no further until he had acquainted the Privy Council with the grounds of his pretensions. His lordship does not appear to have paid much regard to these instructions, for another letter was sent down to him in July when the government had been informed that he had used violence and threats towards two countrymen, contending that they were his bondsmen, and he was again forbidden to resort to force until he had legally proved his alleged rights. The mandate seems to have been dealt with as contemptuously as was its forerunner. Nearly a year later, May the 7th, 1587, the Privy Council addressed him again, pointing out that although he had raised no action at law against the Coles, and had refused to answer their suit against him, yet he had again violently attempted to seize them, and that they had been consequently forced to forbear from following their business, such conduct was a breach of the Queen's peace, and he was summoned to appear before the Council to justify his conduct. It seems clear that he was still refractory, for on November the 15th the Council ordered that the continued complaint of the Coles and the claim of their persecutors should be heard and determined on December the 5th by the Lord Chancellor and two other judges. As there is no further reference to the case, the arrogant peer was doubtless defeated. The most amazing fact in reference to the subject is that the corporation apparently paid no effort to defend the privileges of the city. Alderman Richard Cole died in 1599. In his will, which disposed of every extensive property in Bristol and Somerset, he bequeathed thirty pounds to repair the road to Gloucester, near Newport, where I was born. His widow, Alice, sister of John Carr, 
founder of Queen Elizabeth's Hospital, was a large benefactor to local charities, and the funds bequeathed by her are still administered by trustees. The corporation in December 1586 increased the stipend of the town clerk from £4 to £10 per annum. This amount, however, inadequately indicates the real official income, which was largely derived from fees. For some unexplained reason, the civic body at this period experienced considerable difficulty in finding a well-to-do member disposed to take the office of mayor. In the audit book for 1585 to 1586 are the following entries. Receive of Alderman Brown, together with 11 pieces of ordinance, in consideration of being exempted forever from the office of morality, £20. Received of Thomas Colston for the same consideration, £20. It is somewhat remarkable that by much the largest fine paid for similar redemption does not appear in the accounts. Two years later, when the Common Council made one of its numerous but always unsuccessful attempts to reap a profit out of the House of Correction by setting the inmates to work, proposing on this occasion that the prisoners should dye and dress cloth, a stock of fifty pounds was advanced to the keeper, which, the Chamberlain notes, was part of the money given by William Young, merchant in Mr. Cole's year, 1585 to 1586, to be discharged for ever of the office of mayor. Nothing more is recorded respecting the dyeing industry, and in 1597 the Chamberlain paid four pounds for an iron mill for the House of Convection, the purpose of which is not explained. About the date of the execution of the Queen of Scots, the city authorities were thrown into a panic. The Chamberlain records, 1587, February, paid to sundry persons who carried precepts of hue and cry to sundry places when the report was given that London was fired, and that armour should be in readiness three shillings six dimes. The alarming incident is not mentioned by the local chroniclers. An illustration of the Earl of Leicester's cool methods of procedure occurred in the same month. The corporation paid £42 for three bucks of sack, which were ordered to be sent to the Archbishop of Canterbury, Lord Treasurer, Burghley and Leicester, in hope of the continuance of their good will and favour to the city. As Lord Leicester was about to visit Bath, the butt intended for him seems to have been retained until his arrival. The two others were forwarded to London by a wainsman at a cost of four pounds, but on their reaching the capital, a servant of Leicester, by his direction, tapped one of the huge pieces and abstracted between three and four gallons of wine, which the troubled Chamberlain had to supply by purchase before making the presentation. In addition to the above gifts, the corporation shortly afterwards sent a piece of plate to Sir James Croft, a member of the Privy Council, who had presumably taken umbrage at being unrewarded, and it was also deemed prudent to forward a rug coverlet, costing two pounds ten shillings, to the Lord's Treasurer, Private Secretary, to keep him also in a good humour. An account by a contemporary analyst of a fatal conflict in King Road in July 1587 incidentally throws some light upon a profitable traffic of Bristol merchants, which developed largely in the following century. The exportation overseas of hides and skins was then forbidden by statute. Nevertheless, some prominent local merchants had, by a judicious offer of ready money, and by undertaking to surrender a share of their yearly profits, induced the avaricious queen to override the law of the land by granting them a license to export calf skins, a material in much demand on the continent, 
for conversion into slim shoe leather. Agents were accordingly employed in South Wales and the adjoining counties to buy up the skins, but it may be presumed that the prices given were considered inadequate, and that the exclusive privilege of the Bristolians was regarded as unjust. At all events, one Edward Whitson, a tanner in the forest of Dean, in concert with his neighbours, loaded a barge boat in the Wye near Tinton, which calf skins in the hope of smuggling the cargo on board a French ship lying in King Road. It is probable that this is by no means the first effort made to evade the licences, and that they had employed spies to give information, for knowledge of Whitson's design had reached the city before the departure of his boat. Mr. Thomas James, afterwards MP, and some other merchants interested in the business thereupon resolved on capturing the cargo by main force, and having armed themselves for the purpose, went down in a pinnace to await the smugglers. The latter, clearly foreseeing a collision, were provided with pikes, bows and arrows, targets and leather coats. According to the local chronicler, the forest men were the first to commence hostilities, and having wounded one of the Bristol crew with an arrow, someone believed to be Mr. James, retaliated by firing a musket, by which one Gitton, the owner of the other boat, was killed. Nothing is said respecting the fate of the smuggled skins, and the subsequent proceedings are involved in some obscurity. A local analyst says that Mr. James was tried for manslaughter in the Admiralty Court in London, as the forest men, for conceivable reasons, did not attempt to give evidence. He was acquitted. James must afterwards have appealed to the government, for the Privy Council in the first place commanded his co-partners in the calf skin licence to pay a proportionate share of his expenses which they had previously refused to do, and then, April 1588, ordered by the mayor and aldermen to summon the sheriffs of Bristol of the previous year to make restitution of the money and goods that they had taken from James as a composition. For Gitton's death, the justices were further directed to require Christopher Whitson's, a merchant, to give bond in £1,000 for his appearance in the following term to answer charges that would be brought against him by the crown james had probably alleged that whitson had acted in collusion with his namesake in the forest notwithstanding this mandate the sheriffs refused to surrender the confiscated property and the privy council had to content themselves with directing the mayor to settle the dispute as he thought fit but Whitson was arrested in November 1588 and lodged in the fleet prison on no specified charge and there he remained for upwards of two years. In December 1590 he appealed for release to the Privy Council who by that time had totally forgotten why he was apprehended. They now admitted that his case was grievous and asked the Lord Chief Baron an explanation his lordship replied that he knew nothing about the case but that whitson had been detained upon the often an earnest motion of attorney general popham doubtless a friend of james whitson afterwards became prosperous and served the office of mayor end of chapter nine Chapter 10 of 16th Century Bristol by John Latimer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 Queen Elizabeth in November 1587 appointed six commissioners to inquire into the merits of a singular dispute between the Reverend A. Arthur, rector of St. Mary Le Port, and his parishioners. The rector, on whose petition the commission was granted, had been appointed to the living about eight years previously. He asserted that the parishioners 
had for forty years concealed the fact that the rectory was in the gift of the crown and had appointed at their pleasure a mere minister or curate and appropriated the profits of the rectory these profits he claimed for the entire forty years there is no record of the commissioner's decision nor can any evidence be discovered to support the allegation that the advowson was the property of the crown through the sailing of the invincible armada of the spanish king had been postponed in fifteen eighty seven through the daring exploits of drake and other causes its approach in the following year was regarded as certain and the english people universally betook themselves to defensive preparations in march the bristolians were summoned to muster at lady day before their captain-general at redcliffe church to choose out trained soldiers and the large force was soon in arms and regularly drilled the common council ordered another new ancient gigantic banner composed of thirty-seven and three-quarter yards of taffeta and directed the portcullises at the city gates to be looked unto and the town walls to be repaired about the same time the government availing itself of the royal prerogative under which ship money was claimed for maritime towns in case of emergency demanded aid from every port in the shape of ships instead of coin london was required to furnish eight ships fully manned armed and provisioned the call on bristol and also on newcastle was for three ships and a pinnace similarly provided the outlay in these and minor incidences must have been raised by some form of local taxation of the inhabitants but evidence of this point cannot be discovered the cities contingent to the national fleet the great unicorn the minone the handmaid and the aid provisioned for two months sailed in april amidst enthusiastic farewells to join the navy in the english channel the government did not contribute a sixpence towards the expenditure yet in june when the victuals were exhausted a letter was received from the lord admiral requesting the city to furnish supplies lord howard was in fact unable to extract money from the queen sufficient to victual her own ships the corporation appealed to the privy council representing that the citizens were utterly exhausted by the efforts already made and were unable to bear any further charge but the council insisted that the stores should be furnished without delay promising to defray the outlay at a later date the supplies were provided but no repayment was ever received at the great fair all the canvas offered for sale was brought up by order of the government and dispatched to make tents for the vast army assembled at tilbury the week was one of the intense excitement for the conflict was known to have begun and though the queen's players came to town and were rewarded with double the ordinary gift for their performance the inhabitants were thinking of anything but the drama the civic rulers sent off a messenger to the south coast to understand some news of the fleets but the journey seems to have been fruitless at length early in august a letter was received from london bringing certain news of the ignominious flight of the spaniards when thirteen shillings four dimes was paid to the bearer for his promptitude and the city burst into jubilation the queen's players and tumblers adding an extra flash of gaiety to the rejoicings the irritating old analysts do not afford a scrap of information as to the fate of the bristol ships no doubt like nearly every crew in the fleet the men had to take part in the final route of the enemy when destitute of food and almost helpless from want of gunpowder which no entreaties could induce elizabeth to supply whilst the country was threatened with the hostility of philip the second 
the government was frequently troubled by the anonymity of the Dutch, who had been much exasperated by the Queen's torturous policy during their long struggle for emancipation from Spanish tyranny. In February 1588, the Privy Council addressed a letter to the judge of the Admiralty Court, setting forth that, upwards of a year previously, William Colston of Bristol, merchant, an ancestor direct or collateral of the great philanthropist, in satisfaction of spoils and wrongs inflicted on him by the Admiralty of Zealand, had seized a ship in cargo of the Zealander, that the Privy Council, at the request of the Dutch deputies, had given orders for the release of the vessel, on the undertaking of the deputies, that justice should be done to Colston, that the latter, after labouring for ten months, had secured a judicial condemnation of the Zealand authorities, and that nevertheless he should obtain no redress. The judge was therefore ordered to give directions for the seizure of any Zealand ship and cargo found in an English port, such ship to be detained for three months to give the Dutch government an opportunity of complying with the judgment given against them. If they neglected to do so, the ship and cargo were to be given up to Colston in satisfaction of his claims. This order having proved of no effect, the council in the following May sent fresh instructions to the Admiralty judge, giving further particulars of Colston's grievances. The letter states that the Bristol ship was seized near Flushing, in August 1586, and confiscated together with the cargo, the owner's loss being £2,286, and that whilst Colston was on his way to seek relief, he was made prisoner by a Dunkirk rover, from whom he was forced to ransom himself, his total outlay being £600. The interest on these losses amounted to £381, making his total claim against the states of Holland and Zealand £3,267. The Privy Council therefore orders the judge to grant a commission for the arrest of Dutch ships until Colston obtained full satisfaction. Being armed with this warrant, Mr. Colston thought himself entitled to follow the example set by the Dutch, and not merely recovered his claim but continued to make further seizures. In August, however, he was peremptorily ordered by the government to sell no more confiscated goods, and to appear before the Privy Council to render accounts. There was no further reference on the subject. On a death in September 1588 of the Earl of Leicester, which Ben Johnson asserted was caused by a poisoned potion, that the earl had prepared for his countess, the common council followed its usual course by confirming the high stewardship of the city on Lord Burghley, the head of the government. No opportunity was lost of conciliating the powerful minister. In 1590, his second son, William, afterwards Earl of Salisbury, visited Bristol and was welcomed with a present of £38 of sugar, two boxes of marmalade, gilded very fair, and four barrels of suckets, entertainment being also provided for himself and retinue. In the following year a gift of an undescribed character, but costing eleven pounds ten shillings, was made to Burghley himself, who did not lose sight of his yearly pension of four pounds. A sergeant painter at arms was paid three pounds for the Lord Treasurer's portrait, which was framed for five shillings and set up in the council house, where it is still to be seen. In 1596, William Cecil, then become Secretary of State, was presented with a double gilt silver cup weighing 44 ounces and costing five pounds eight shillings. The secretaries of both the ministers were duly and sometimes largely rewarded for keeping their masters in mind of city's request. Gifts were, in fact, looked for 
by every important official. In 1594, a butt of sack was sent to another of the Queen's lovers, Lord Keeper Hatton, doubtless in return for some service. The clerk of the Privy Council and the clerk of the Crown also figure for handsome donations. In 1598, the clerk of the Parliament by some means got hold of two new white rugs, value five pounds four shillings, belonging to the corporation, and detained them in regard he had been our friend in the late Parliament. Though sometimes overreached in this way by high-placed cormorants, the civic body was by no means disposed to spend money profitlessly. On one occasion when the Lord Admiral, according to the custom of his predecessors, contested the city's right to hold an admiralty court, the Chamberlain brought a fine piece of plate for him, in the hope that the gift would smooth over difficulties. But finding his lordship intractable, the civic agent gave the silversmith ten shillings to refine the cast and take the plate back again. Fuel appears to have been at a very moderate price in 1589, the Common Council having in that year established a school over Froom Gate to teach children not to read, but to knit worst hosom. Forty loads of stone coal were purchased for ten shillings to warm the large room. At the same time, six loads of charcoal and a double draught of wood for the Tolsey fires cost eight shillings ten dimes. It is difficult to determine the weight of a sledge load, but as butts of wine containing nearly a hundred and twenty gallons were certainly moved about on sledges, a load of coal can hardly have been less than one-third of a tone. Firewood was cheap owing to the abundance of neighbouring timber. Several trees were cut down in Lewin's Mead in 1589. Information respecting an ancient Bristol custom established by a charter of Edward III, upwards of 200 years before this date, is furnished by the minutes of the Privy Council in March 1590. In a letter to the Mayor and his assistants in orphans' causes, the lordships stated that they had been informed that the chief magistrate of the city for the time being had always been governor of orphans and had provided for their education and the preservation of their estates in accordance with the city charters but the council now understood that this good system was no longer carried out and that orphans had been and were likely to be defrauded by persons having possession of their property, who refused to give the mayor full information thereof. Their lordships, therefore, having regard for such orphans, commanded the mayor and his brethren to pursue strictly the ancient practice, to summon all widows and guardians having the custody of orphans, money, goods or lands, and to inquire whether any embezzlement had been attempted of the property committed to them or resisted the mayor's authority over the children they were ordered to be imprisoned until they gave satisfaction it may be safely conjectured that the issue of this mandate had been privately solicited by the corporation through some friend at court at an earlier period Large sums bequeathed to children had frequently been brought into the city treasury and remained there for several years until the infant owners attained full age, and whilst the corporation in the meanwhile dealt with such funds at their discretion. There is no evidence that they rendered a fair interest on the capital. The ancient custom consequently fell into disfavour, and testators, sometimes gave specific directions to their executors to keep aloof from the orphan's court. The mandate of the government having failed to effect its purpose, the corporation, while promoting a bill in Parliament in 1597 for confirming the establishment of Queen Elizabeth's Hospital, obtained the insertion of clauses empowering them 
to act as the privy council had directed and authorizing the chamberlain to take possession of property when executors or trustees refused to give sureties for the faithful performance of their duties it was however provided that if a tester limited the management of his estate to a parent brother or other relation of his children or if such relation entered into sufficient bonds for securing the orphan's estates the mayor and his brethren were not to interfere the decay of the old system thus continued and it gradually became obsolete dr fletcher the supple divine in whose favour the see of bristol was separated from that of gloucester after being practically extinct for forty-one years made his appearance in the city in july fifteen ninety when he was welcomed by the corporation and presented with thirty gallons of sack and twenty pounds of sugar from the wording of the chamberlain's record of this gift it is clear that the civic body were ignorant of even the name of the new prelate at his arrival being the queen's almoner and seleducer's courtier the bishop could spare little time for his episcopal duties but he made another brief visit two years later when the corporation honouring the almoner more than the clerk gave him half a hundred weight of sugar which cost one shillings one and a half dimes per pound in fifteen ninety three he was promoted to the see of worcester and the bishopric of bristol which he had greatly impoverished remained vacant for ten years so far as can be discovered the corporation up to this time had never availed themselves of st mark's church for religious purposes the edifice was not however wholly deserted thomas pinchin one of the monks of the old hospital who were granted a yearly pension of six pounds each when they were dispossessed of it by henry the eighth received two pounds additional from the corporation to act as reader in the church and resided in an adjoining tenant until his death about forty-five years later when a new curate was appointed who also received forty shillings yearly as wages on the establishment of queen elizabeth's hospital the common council seems to have resolved on alterations in the church with a view to accommodating the schoolboys a stone pulpit was introduced several old pews were removed to make way for benches a number of new wainscot pews were constructed and the entire interior was decorated plentifully with whitewash the work went on day and night in order to be ready for the queen's accession day in november fifteen ninety from which one might presume that a civic visit in state was in contemplation but if such had been proposed it was abandoned for when the holiday arrived cushions were carried from the tolsey to the cathedral for the comfort of the worshipful body during the sermon in the following march there is an interesting item in the chamberlain's accounts ten shillings being paid to a mason for removing the great tombs of the three founders of the gaunts which are now set at the upper end of the chancel their original position is unfortunately not recorded through corporate caprice at a later date the tombs were removed to the south aisle of the church where they still remain at this period the commerce of the city was in an extremely depressed state the chief foreign trade of bristol for several generations had been with spain and portugal where vast quantities of fish caught by local crews in the northern atlantic were exchanged for the wines fruit and oil of the peninsula this highly profitable traffic had been largely curtailed long before the outbreak of war by english adventurers like drake who burning with indignation at the cruel prosecution 
of the Protestants in the Netherlands, and at the tortures inflicted by the Spanish Inquisition on the crews of English ships carrying on an illicit traffic with King Philip's colonies in the New World set international law at defiance, and took to the seas as systematic buccaneers. The eventual declaration of war between the two powers, of course, suspended legitimate trade altogether. Maritime relations with southern France, the only other important centre of local commerce, were on an equally unsatisfactory footing, although the two governments were ostensibly on friendly terms. The slaughter in 1572 of upwards of 50,000 Huguenots in France, commonly known as the Massacre of St. Bartholomew, and hallowed by the exhortation thanksgivings of the Pope, aroused a passionate thirst for vengeances throughout this country, and the bigotry of the infamous French king was met by a bigotry as remorseless as his own. Happily, the many butcheries of Romish priests in England have no connection with local history. Elizabeth's efforts, or pretended efforts, to suppress flibbering on the ocean were powerless against the convenience of the whole sea-going population of her own customs officers who claimed a share of the piratical spoils of the gentry and merchants of the west of england who had helped to equip the adventurers one or two illustrations of the state into which legitimate commerce was brought under such circumstances may be offered from the state papers. In June 1592, a French official acting for the merchants of Bayonne informed the Privy Council that in the previous year a ship belonging to that port was returning home with a cargo valued at 5,000 crowns when she was captured by a vessel belonging to Sir Walter Raleigh and taken up to Uphill near western super mare where certain rich merchants of bristol received the cargo and still held it having forced the owner's agents to take to flight by threats against his life in another case reported by the same official a still more valuable bayonne ship and cargo had been captured by three english vessels and taken into the port of bristol where several of the pirates lived and the plunder was there openly sold, the ruined owner being refused redress. There is no evidence of any action having been taken against Raleigh and his accomplices. The other affair was so discreditable to the second city in the kingdom that the Privy Council ordered the owners of the English ships to surrender half the cargo to the Bayonne man and to pay him sixty pounds a sum so pitiful as to raise a suspicion that the government sympathised with the freebooters. This mandate being coolly ignored, the Privy Council, after the lapse of another year, addressed a letter to the mayor and aldermen, desiring them to see that the Frenchmen received satisfaction, and pointing out that the further delay would provoke the French to equip privateers to prey on English commerce. The answer of the corporation has perished. Whatever they may have done, the warning of the Privy Council was soon justified. In September 1596, John Love and other Bristol merchants made a clamorous complaint to the government that a French piratical vessel had seized their ship, the Adventure, was on her home voyage from Brest, laden with linen canvas etc their total loss being estimated at five thousand pounds by that time the french had remonstrated against several other piratical acts of english rovers one of which was partially owned by our old friend thomas james and the privy council declined to take any action end of chapter ten Chapter 11 of 16th Century Bristol 
by John Latimer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven. In February fifteen ninety-two, Alderman Philip Langley was required by the Common Council to pay a fine of fifty pounds for being relieved for ever of the office of mayor. The charge seems to have been an unjust exaction, inasmuch as the alderman had served as chief magistrate ten years previously, as he had also represented the city in Parliament from 1571 to 1581. Mr. Langley was probably far advanced in years. The city audit books at this period are singularly barren of interesting features. In 1592, the Lord Admiral made another effort to deprive the corporation of its admiralty jurisdiction, doubtless in order to secure the fees and perquisites in maritime disputes and disasters arising within the port. And Dr. Julius Caesar, judge of the admiralty court in London, was sent down as a special commissioner to investigate the subject. He held a prolonged inquiry, during which the civic body, which had already spent thirty pounds in gratifications to courtiers in the hope of adverting the attack, treated the learned visitor with profuse hospitality, and made him a costly present of sweet meats. In the result, the chartered privileges of the city were found incontestable, and the Lord Admiral appears to have withdrawn his pretensions, though his defeat did not prevent some of his successors from asserting his similar vexatious pretensions. The only other noticeable fact of the year was the capture of a porpoise near Temple Back. It was presented to the mayor for his personal delectation. The chief magistrate appears to have had peculiar rights over piscatory novelties. A few months later, on a hollybutt being discovered in the fish market, the Chamberlain bought it for four shillings and sent it to the mayor, and in the following year his worship was the recipient of a sturgeon caught in the Avon. The account books for 1593 and 1595 have perished. An interesting letter illustrating the impoverished condition of the Bristol clergy through the rapid spread of Puritanism appears in the Privy Council minutes of March sixteenth, 1593. I have already drawn attention to the fact that the corporation, when attending the cathedral on state occasions, repaired there to hear not the liturgy but the sermon, in this they followed the prevalent taste of the age, and as many of the parochial incumbents, some of whom held other livings in the country, seem to have rarely preached the yearly offerings that had once been voluntarily rendered to them by the city parishioners, ceased to be given. The Privy Council, writing to the Mayor, Elderman, and the Custos of the Sea of Bristol, then vacant, remarked that they have been informed that the state of the city clergy is very mean and poor, their benefices being for the most part not worth more than eight pounds or nine pounds a year each, although in time of superstition they yielded a sufficient maintenance for learned men. Their lordships had also been informed that out of the common purse of the city a voluntary contribution was made to maintain three preachers, while wealthy citizens gave little or nothing to enlarge the stipends of the poor incumbents. The civic body were therefore required to cause a reasonable assessment to be imposed on such burgesses, as did not contribute to the maintenance of the poor ministers, especially of those who were preachers, and also towards supporting common readers, until by better encouragement the livings might be furnished with able and learned men, 
a remark far from complimentary to those actually in possession. The names of persons refusing to subscribe were to be sent up to the council, with a report as to their means and abilities. The request of the government was obeyed, though the legal right of the corporation to impose a tax for such a purpose might well be questioned, and was possibly repudiated by many citizens. From a document of a few years later date, the annual sum raised was only about £44, averaging less than £3 per parish. Out of this total, the vicar of St. Nicholas, whose income was only £2.13 shillings four dimes, received £10, and the doles to his colleagues varied from six to one pounds. The city preachers, maintained by the corporation, appeared to have received about thirty pounds each per annum. The value of the vicarage of St. Nicholas in 1428 was officially reported to be twenty pounds, a sum certainly equivalent to fifty pounds in 1593. During a period extending from about 1570 to 1593, the vestry of St. Nicholas's parish received a number of gifts and bequests from various citizens, who had directed that the yearly interest should be distributed amongst poor parishioners in doles of money or of bread. It will be remembered that poor rates were still in the future. The above benefactions appear to have been advanced in temporary loans on good security, with the ultimate view of making an advantageous purchase of land, and in March 1594, when the fund at disposal amounted to £548, the vestry, adding £42 to the total from the church stock, acquired a house garden and about 13 acres of meadow near Baptist Mills, in the parish of St. James, for £590. It may be assumed that from the outset, the rent derived from the estate sufficed to produce the yearly gifts designed by the benefactors, about £30 in all, but it can scarcely have done more than this during the following century, owing to the purely rural character of the locality and it is significant that the place obtained the name of the forlorn hope. In course of time, however, the growth of the population in the district had its natural effect. A few houses were built on the property, the remainder of the meadow was divided into gardens, on which some occupiers squatted in wooden huts, and in 1821 the vestry granted a new lease of the estate for seven years at a rental of a hundred and fifty two pounds until eighteen eighteen the parish authorities continued to pay the doles originally fixed by the donors of the charities and made use of the surplus at their discretion it was then determined however to apply all the proceeds less one fourteenth as the share of the church stock to the objects designed by the benefactor. This honourable conduct eventually plunged the vestry into painful embarrassment. In 1857, the charity estates of the parish had risen in yearly value to £450, and the approaching termination of the lease of Forlorn Hope was expected to add £200 a year to that amount. Already at every approach of the Christmas dolls, the parish was inundated by worthless idlers and vagabonds, who hired a few nights' shelter to secure a share of the spoil, and spent their gains in vicious dissipation. The reform then effected is recorded in the annals of Bristol in the 19th century. Since that date the old hovels on the forlorn hope estate have given place to several streets of substantial dwellings which must have vastly increased the income of the charity in 1594 the corporation revived the court of the manor of temple fee so long held by the knights of st john 
as the criminal jurisdictions of the court had been absorbed by the ordinary tribunals of the city. It is difficult to conjecture why the old institution was restored. It afforded, however, an opportunity for a feast. The mayor and his brethren partaking of a dinner which cost five pounds, a separate banquet for the jurymen who possibly presented nuisances entailed the modest outlay of six shillings for dimes. An entry in the minutes of the Privy Council, dated October the 5th, 1595, affords information in reference to a still existing Bristol charity that was totally ignored by the old analysts, and is scarcely mentioned by many later historians. Very soon after the incorporation of the Merchants Ventures Society by Edward VI, in December 1552, this body acquired the desecrated chapel of St. Clement, which had been built about half a century earlier by a fraternity of mariners. Intending to use the building as their hall, and before October 1561, they had erected, on an adjoining plot of ground, an almshouse for the reception of aged or impotent seamen. Most of the early records of the society having perished, it is impossible to discover how arrangements were effected for maintaining this institution. But by some means the merchants' company were empowered to collect two small imposts to be presently described, and to extend their benevolent operations, addressing the mayor and aldermen on the date given above, the Privy Council state that they have been informed that in time past an almshouse was erected in Bristol for the relief of aged and infirm sailors, which was maintained by the levying of one and a half dimes per ton on goods, and one penny in the pound on sailors' wages which imposts also supported a free school for sailors' children, and afforded a yearly stipend to a minister at Shirehampton Chapel for edifying the crews of the ships lying at Hung Road. It being understood that this laudable and godly order was being withstood by some, especially by those going on fishing voyages to Newfoundland, to the impoverishment of the hospital, the Privy Council required the mayor and aldermen to assist the collectors in gathering the dues from those attempting to evade them. The years from 1594 to 1597 were marked by disastrous harvests, and the distress amongst the poor of Bristol, great from the beginning of the dearth, increased to an appalling extent before its close. A singular story concerning John Whitson's trading operations during this period is related in Adam's local chronicle, which states that the mayor and alderman in November 1595, foreseeing the probability of a great rise in the price of grain, commissioned Whitson to buy 3,000 quarters of Danzire rice. He consequently went to London and made a contract for that quantity at twenty-eight shillings per quarter, to be delivered in the following May. Subsequently, the civic rulers appudiated the arrangement, declining to be responsible for more than half of the grain, throwing the risk of the other moiety on Whitson, and laid upon him half the expense, over eight pounds, incurred in making the bargain. But when the cargoes arrived in July, the prospect of another bad harvest had raised the price of rye to 44 shillings per quarter, showing an enormous profit on the adventure, whereupon the worshipful alderman entreated Whitson to surrender his shares of the grain, and offered him fifty pounds for his trouble. Adams goes on to say that Whitson, being a good-natured man, consented to this cool proposition. But the writer practically contradicts himself on this point, for he adds that the corporation, after a gratis distribution of some pecks and half bushels amongst the poor, sold the bulk of the corn at 48 shillings per quarter, 
and thereby cleared seven hundred and seventy four pounds whereas the profit must have been at least double that amount the mayor's calendar alleges that the corporate gain was seven hundred pounds part of which was expended in obtaining the act for confirming the customs of the orphans court already referred to that act cannot have been very costly and it is not a little remarkable that not a trace of the funds derived from this early exploit in municipal trading is to be found in the civic accounts with the exception of a payment of seven pounds to whitson for his charges for a journey to london to buy rye for this city the foreign supplies however were soon consumed and in the closing months of the year the secrecy amounted to an actual famine one chronicler recording that wheat rose for a time to the almost incredible price of a hundred and sixty shillings per quarter the privy council ordered the authorities of gloucestershire and worcestershire to permit corn to be sent down the severn to bristol for the relief of the inhabitants and similar mandates were subsequently addressed to the justices of wilts and somerset the mayor's calendar states that the executors of robert kitchen distributed sixty six pounds weekly out of his estate amongst the suffering poor but the most notable measure for relief was adopted by the corporation who ordered that the mayor the alderman and every burgess of any worth should daily give according to their respective means one meal of meat to from two to eight destitute people whereby all were saved from starving or rioting in february fifteen ninety six queen elizabeth revived the unpopular impost of ship money for the alleged purpose of defending the english channel against the spanish warships and dunkirk privateers then ravaging english commerce the demand made on bristol was for three ships fully manned and provisioned the outlay being estimated at two and a half thousand pounds but of this sum somerset to was contribute six hundred pounds the city of gloucester drawing forty pounds from tewkesbury two hundred pounds the city of worcester forty pounds shrewsbury sixty six pounds and cardiff forty pounds in the mandate imposing the burden the government ordered the mayor and alderman not to extort more from these contributors than the sum specified they were further directed to assemble all the able-bodied seamen in the port and to impress as many of them as would be required to man the vessels these requirements extorted a wail from the corporation who in a piteous supplication for relief addressed to the privy council set forth the depressed condition of local commerce the city it was asserted had become so poor that it was unable to bear the proposed burden londoners had not only monopolized its old and profitable trade with southern europe but they had through their riches acquired the internal trade of the kingdom to within ten miles of bristol whose merchants could not gain by any possible adventure spanish commerce had once employed twenty or thirty taller ships here but king philip's embargo and english reprisals had reduced this fleet to eight or ten small vessels such laden ships as now entered the avon mostly belonged to strangers who would not export bristol goods whereby manufacturers are towards an utter overthrow the chief merchants of the city having lost hope had retired from business and retired into the country whilst the meaner sort had spent what they had or were trading without advantage londoners in short had monopolized everything the eagle followeth the carcass and no wonder the enemy so often falls upon them but that they wealthy and strong should meanly press the queen and our poor purses to secure their own gains is surely a great wonder 
The Privy Council, doubtless believing that these complaints were exaggerated, although they unquestionably were based on a sound substratum of truth, refused to abate their demands. Whereupon the corporation, by levying a rate upon the inhabitants, succeeded in meeting the Queen's requirements, in despite of the Somerset gentry withholding their quota, and the three ships fully equipped joined the Royal Navy, and took part in the memorable sack of Cardiz. One of them was commanded by John Hopkins, merchant, elected mayor in 1600. On their return, when the crews were paid off, the corporation made a fresh appeal to the Privy Council, representing that Bristol merchants had lost £12,000 by disasters at sea during the previous three years, and complaining that Somerset had obstinately evaded the contribution imposed upon it. The government, expressing great satisfaction at the exertions of the citizens, sent a strong remonstrance to the county authorities against their unpatriotic lethargy. But the gentry still sought to escape the charge by preserving a policy of silence. After a year's delay, their council sent down a more imperative mandate, which produced nothing save a lamentation over agricultural distress, which was common to all parts of the kingdom. The council next instructed Lord Chief Justice Popham to persuade the gentry to do their duty at the following assize, and as Popham was presented soon afterwards with a butt of sack by the corporation, it is probable that his remonstrances had a satisfactory result. Some of the proceedings of the common council about this time were of a strangely reactionary character. During the early years of Elizabeth's reign, the medieval corporate laws debarring strangers from settling and carrying on trade in the city were so far relaxed that persons of that class were permitted to become freemen on the payment of moderate fines, and were known as redemptioners though the reform must have tended to promote the general prosperity of the port it was of course obnoxious to those selfishly animated by the old spirit of monopoly and their jealousy seems at length to have permitted the civic body on february twenty second fifteen ninety six a corporate ordinance was passed absolutely forbidding any foreign merchant or trader to be admitted a burgess either by redemption or on petition an exception was made as regards artificers or men pursuing a manual occupation but the qualifications of such applicants were to be carefully investigated by a special committee the members of which were to be fined a hundred pounds if they contravened the true purpose of the ordinance even for mechanics the door of admission was rigidly guarded for another ordinance of a few months previous date imposed a fine of six shillings eight dimes per week upon every craftsman who employed a foreign or stranger workman bringing a wife or children into the city some illustrations were given in a previous chapter of the piratical raids of english merchant ships against the commerce of foreign nations with whom the country was at peace another local case of a revolting character is recorded in the privy council minutes dated june twenty fourth fifteen ninety six in a warrant addressed to all the maritime officers of the crown throughout the realm the council stated that they had been informed of a notable outrage committed by thomas webb captain of the ship minion of bristol one of the armada ships upon a dancing vessel returning home with a cargo from lisbon webb had cruelly tortured the master and sailors carried off the entire cargo and despoiled the ship of her anchors and cables whereby she was wrecked and all on board were drowned as the owners could obtain no redress because Webb had sailed to Southampton and Bristol 
where sundry of the inhabitants got possession of the plundered goods and retained them under pretence of the admiralty privileges of the two towns the crown officials were commanded to seize and sequester the merchandise to stay the ship minion for the better satisfaction of the aggrieved merchants and to arrest and imprison webb and his accomplices until they gave bail to stand their trial for the crime webb appears to have escaped and his subordinates were long concealed through the convenience of sympathizers in January 1597, the Privy Council addressed a severe rebuke to the Mayor of Bristol, who, after the offenders had been arrested, had audaciously presumed to liberate three of them, although they were officers of the Minion and Webb's chief instruments. The Mayor was ordered to immediately recapture them, and to make them offer bail. The record of the trial has unluckily perished, it would be interesting to know whether Captain Webb was in any way connected with Alderman John Webb, who became mayor of the city in the following September. In the autumn of 1596, when the city was suffering under the terrible famine already noted, the difficulties of the authorities were greatly increased by the arrival of large bodies of troops on their way to Ireland, who had to be lodged and fed whilst awaiting a favourable wind. The government sought to alleviate the distress by directing the justices of Monmouth and Glamorganshire to facilitate the transport of grain from those counties to Bristol, but the relief can hardly have been important. The corporation on this occasion claimed eight shillings per day from the Privy Council for the diet of each soldier, and ten shillings per head for their transport to the sister island sums greatly in excess of the customary rates and which led to an angry protest and demand for an abatement on the part of the council the result does not appear having regarded to the unprecedented price of bread the charge for food does not seem excessive but the passage money certainly appears exorbitant only eighteen months later the chamberlain shipped off sixty-six irish beggars to their own country at a cost of one shilling per head for the voyage the vast extent of business transacted at the celebrated bristol fair is indicated by an entry in the privy council minutes for january fifteen ninety seven a large number of london tradesmen regularly attended the fair bringing vast stocks of goods and one of them a mercer sought the help of the council at the above date alleging that his servants on returning home were robbed of one thousand seven hundred pounds besides bills and notes at the fair in fifteen ninety a party of irish merchants brought such extensive cargoes of rugs and other material that they overstocked the market being unwilling to carry the goods back again and the corporate laws forbidding strangers to open a shop they made a bargain with the chamberlain and paid a fine of five pounds for liberty to sell to all foreigners for three days after that the citizens had first bought of them for three days before foreigners were of course residents outside the city boundaries the virgin queen's last favourite the brilliant but giddy-headed earl of essex paid a visit to the city in march fifteen ninety seven probably during a west country tour his lordship's position at court being well known preparations were made for his reception including the cleansing of the streets of filth and decorating the high cross and a sumptuous entertainment awaited him at mr havillard's mansion in small street on january the thirteenth fifteen ninety nine soon after the death of lord burgeley the corporation's invariable desire to secure a powerful friend in the royal palace led to a hasty appointment that had to be regretted at leisure the first entry in the earliest civic minute book that has come down to us records the election at the above date of the earl of essex 
Earl Marshall, as High Steward of Bristol, in as ample a manner as the office was hitto for held. A patent embellished with silk and gold thereupon received the common seal, and the Chamberlain was hurried off to London to present it to his lordship, and to order a fine carving of the Earl's arms for the decoration of the council house. Before the ornament had been received, the Earl's star had begun to wane, through his own wilfulness and incapacity, and a puerile, sedacious outbreak a few months later brought his head to the block on Tower Hill. Even before this catastrophe, the corporation recognised its blunder, and began its search for a more stable patron. It first besought the friendship of the Queen's cousin and Chamberlain, Lord Hunston, to whom a costly present of claret, hullock, and sugar loaves was respectfully forwarded. Eventually, however, the civic rulers turned their devotions towards a more powerful minister, the Lord Treasurer Buckhurst, and tendered him a still larger token of homage. On the execution of Essex, Buckhurst, of course, succeeded to the vacant high stewardship. End of chapter 11「Twelve of Sixteenth Century Bristol by John Latimer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve. The heavy exactions on the city in the shape of ship money and the refusal of the Somerset gentry to contribute their quota of the impost appear to have temporarily shamed the government into a more liberal policy. Instead of exhorting funds for feeding and shipping off troops for Ireland, as had been previously the invariable custom, remittances were sent down with the soldiers in 1597 and confided to the corporation, and on July the 15th the Privy Council, in the letter to the Mayor William Yate, greatly commended that gentleman's arrangements for victualling and transporting 800 men a course of conduct, they added, that contrasted widely with the waste and private stealing that had been many times experienced at other ports. Such trust, so honourably discharged, continued the letter, moved the council to think the mayor met to undertake further services, and he was therefore desired to buy up and transport victuals for the Irish army which was clearly unable to find food in the devastated island. The customer of Bristol had been ordered to advance money for carrying out these directions, and the justices of the neighbouring counties, including South Wales, were required to render the mayor assistance in obtaining supplies. The considerate policy of the court was of short duration. The next mention in the civic records of the migration of troops is a minute of a meeting of the Common Council, specially convened to demand loans from the members for feeding and transporting the men dumped down upon the city authorities. Down to this period, the meat market of the city was held in the open streets, and the setting up of stalls in the narrow thoroughfares must have greatly impeded locomotion. In 1598, the executors of Robert Kitchen in accordance with the powers conferred upon them by the alderman's will, devoted a portion of his estate to the erection of a covered market in the rear of a house on the east side of Broad Street, and transferred the building to the corporation, who undertook to distribute the rents derived from standings in charitable benefactions. It would appear that the butchers were by no means desirous of being removed from their usual positions, and the common council, finding it prudent to respect ancient customs, were content to deal with the country tradesmen, who brought in meat on market days, the foreigners being ordered, in April 1599, to sell exclusively in the new market. 
Even this arrangement, however, was unsatisfactory to the resident purveyors, who speedily complained that their stranger rivals, instead of hastening to dispose of their goods and depart, as had been the previous habits, now compensated themselves for the tolls by loitering in their new quarters, to the great injury of local traders and bending to the free burgesses the council ordered in the following june that the countrymen should close their stalls at two o'clock in the winter months and an hour later in summer the market was nevertheless still obnoxious to the bristol butchers and the civic rulers soon after appointing a committee to consider the desirability of closing the building altogether the committee never produced a report and there are indications that the selfishness of the complaining clique who doubtless wished to establish a monopoly brought about a corporate reaction on december the fourth in consequence of an inordinate advance in the price of candles the council requested the mayor and aldermen to make an inquiry into the rates which the butchers were demanding for tallow and to fix a reasonable price at which candles should be thenceforth sold the butchers seem to have proved refractory for the ordinance to redress the excessive price of candles giving chandlers in the neighbouring country districts full liberty to bring in and sell any quantity of candles notwithstanding the ordinary laws against foreign commodities a concluding reference may be made to the cost of travelling in elizabethan days in the summer of fifteen ninety nine after a review of the city trained bands the chamberlain made a journey to wilton to present the muster roll to the earl of pembroke lord lieutenant and not finding his lordship at home followed him to court the worthy official was fifteen days on his travels but his inn expenses and those of his manservant including keeping for two horses amounted only to six shillings eight dimes per day the hire of two horses cost two pounds and the servants wages were eight dimes a day when in london the chamberlain took the opportunity to present the clerk of the privy council for intelligence with an irish rug purchased for two pounds at this time a swarm of government officials received small pensions from the corporation including the clerk just referred to the clerk of the crown the clerk of the exchequer and clerk of the estreats the later named consenting to an except four shillings two dimes a year or about a penny per week the story of the spoliation of the bristol friaries by henry the eighth narrated in the early part of this book is recalled to memory by an incident at this period that might have furnished a new illustration to the celebrated spellman when inditing his denunciation of sacrilege the carmelite friary which stood on the site of the present colston hall together with a portion of his extensive gardens was acquired for insignificant sum by the corporation who soon afterwards sold the building and part of the ground to alderman thomas chester the large upper gardens extending to what is now park row fell into the ever greedy hands of sir ralph sadlier by whom they were sold to a bristol merchant named rowland early in the reign of elizabeth a gentleman named john young who had estates in dorset and wilts determined to settle in this city where several of his ancestors had been men of mark and having taken up his residence in the above friary he resolved on constructing an imposing mansion on the site in february fifteen sixty eight he accordingly purchased the old building from alderman chester and proceeded so vigorously with the erection of his great house that it served in fifteen seventy four for the fitting reception of queen elizabeth and her numerous suite during her week's sojourn during which its owner was knighted in reward for his hospitality sir john was not satisfied with this capacious residence 
In 1578 he purchased from the corporation the remaining part of their estate, consisting of a house and garden previously in the occupation of Nicholas Thorne, and he at the same time acquired Rowland's Lodge and garden on Stony Hill. On this latter spot he forthwith set about the construction of the large mansion, now known as the Red Lodge, the beautiful internal decoration of which remains to attest his cultivated taste and ample means. Sir John died in 1589, and it may be noted that at the usual inquest held by the Crown to discover the extent of his estate, the jury declared on their oaths that the yearly value of the great house was fourteen shillings, and that of the Red Lodge twenty shillings. The late owner left an only son, Robert, then nineteen years of age. Within seven years of his attaining his majority, this young man appears to have dissipated most of his fortune, and to have been over head and ears in debt. And on March 29th, 1599, being about to adventure as a soldier in Ireland, and desirous of protecting his Bristol estate from seizure by creditors, he conveyed both the mansions to his half-brother, Nicholas Strangeways, their mother's right to reside in the great house for life being reserved. Strange ways probably disposed of the Red Lodge, but nothing more is recorded about it in the Great Red Book at the Council House. The prodigal returned from Ireland, where he obtained the title of knight, but was probably poorer than ever. Soon afterwards, in conjunction with Strange Ways, he sold the great house for £660 to Sir Hugh Smythe of Long Ashton, and then vanished from history nothing being known of his ultimate fate. The great house subsequently became the residence and factory of two notable sugar refiners, John Knight, followed by Richard Lane, both of whom were mayors of Bristol. The widow of Lane conveyed the mansion in 1708 for £1,300 to Edward Colston, who there established his great school. Parliament, having voted the Queen a subsidy in 1599, a meeting of the Common Council was held in January 1600 to assess the members of that body preliminary to the collection of the impost. The proceedings, though outwardly grave, were really of a farcical character. A subsidy in boroughs was a tax of two shillings eight dimes in the pound on the value of each citizen's personal property, and in the Middle Ages it was doubtless that onerous burden. But as each community was assessed by royal commissioners selected out of resident inhabitants, the gentlemen chosen with a tender respect for the pockets, both of themselves and their neighbours, gradually reduced the charge by underestimating the value of the goods assessed, and the results eventually assumed ludicrous proportions. Thus, on the above occasion, although several members of the council were merchants of great wealth, with extensive stocks of merchandise, the maximum value of the property of any of them was alleged to be twenty pounds, and only fourteen were stated to be worth that amount their less notable colleagues escaping with an assessment of ten pounds. The charge imposed on the general mercantile and trading class is not recorded, but was doubtless framed on a singular basis. It may be fairly assumed that on the average the assessment did not represent so much as one twentieth of the actual property of the taxpayers. Having made this assessment, the Common Council proceeded to make use of it for other purposes. The roads leading into the city were generally in an execrable condition, and in 1600 were so abnormally bad as to force the corporation to take action. On April the 22nd, it was accordingly resolved that every inhabitant, scased, assessed, in the subsidy book, should pay after the rate of fourpence for every pound so scased, and that his money should be employed in the reparation of the highways within the city liberties. It was further ordered that every householder, 
free from the subsidy tax, should work one day in the mending of the roads for the space of eight hours, bringing his own pickaxe and shovel at such time as he should be warned. Any person refusing to pay or to work was to incur a double penalty. This system of compulsory cooperation was in August applied towards maintaining the trained bands, wealthy citizens being required to pay the wages of one or more of the troopers summoned to the yearly muster, and to furnish each of such men with a coat, the penalty for disobeying the latter order being twenty shillings per man. Members of the Common Council were further required to provide arms and armour for the soldiers, and fifty corslets, forty-five guns, a few pikes, and twenty targets were forthwith brought in. The corporation being in need of money, it was next resolved to raise five hundred pounds by loans for four years, the interest on which, probably eight or ten per cent, was ordered to be defrayed by the members of the council, who were to be taxed upon the basis of the subsidy book. Finally, the old law was revived, whereby a citizen was forbidden to sue a fellow burgess in any court save those of the mayor and sheriffs. A person who had been presumed to raise an action of this kind in one of the courts at Westminster was fined ten pounds, and on refusing to pay the penalty was discommodened and dealt with as a foreigner. A final extract, brief but interesting, may be made from the Chamberlain's accounts. 1599, July, paid for the site of the model of Bristol, seen by Mr. Mayor and Mr. Alderman, five shillings. What would the dignitaries of the twentieth century give to behold this remarkable picture of Bristol in the olden time? End of chapter 12 End of 16th Century Bristol by John Latimer Recording by Elaine Webb, Bristol, England.